Story 1 The trip had been a spur-of-the-moment decision, a desperate attempt to escape the mounting pressures of my daily life. The quaint, seemingly serene hotel nestled within the bustling heart of the city seemed like the perfect retreat. Little did I know, it would become the setting of my most unnerving experience. The room was a blend of modern and antique, with its dimly lit ambiance offering a deceptive sense of security. The walls, adorned with vintage portraits, seemed to hold secrets of their own. I remember laughing off the eerie feeling, attributing it to the stories I'd immersed myself in. But as night fell, a chilling unease crept over me. I felt eyes boring into my very soul, an inexplicable presence that sent waves of dread cascading through my body. I convinced myself it was just the exhaustion playing tricks on me, and with that thought, I drifted into a restless sleep. Morning couldn't come soon enough. The sunlight filtering through the curtains brought a temporary relief, a brief respite from the night's unease. It was while I was getting ready, a routine morning, in a not-so-routine setting, that my life took a turn into the realms of unimaginable fear. As I adjusted the air vent, a glint of something unnatural caught my eye. Nestled within the shadows of the vent, obscured from casual view, was a camera. Its lens, cold and unblinking, pointed directly at my bed. Panic set in, a maelstrom of thoughts swirling chaotically. Had someone been watching me as I slept? The violation of my privacy, the sheer audacity of such an act, left me reeling. I rushed to the reception, my words tumbling out in a frenzy of fear and outrage. The staff, their faces a mask of feigned ignorance, promised to investigate, but their nonchalance did little to quell the terror that had taken root in my heart. I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched, of being vulnerable to an unseen observer. The hotel room, once a refuge, now felt like a prison. The thought of staying another night was unbearable. Yet, leaving meant running away, letting the perpetrator win. I was torn between the urge to flee and the need to confront this violation. Deciding to delve deeper, I turned my attention to the camera. It was a sophisticated device, discreet and designed to go unnoticed. The realization that someone had gone to great lengths to observe me was chilling. Who could it be? A staff member with a twisted sense of voyeurism. A previous guest who had left behind a perverse legacy. The possibilities were as numerous as they were disturbing. Determined to uncover the truth, I embarked on a quest that would lead me down a rabbit hole of secrets and lies. The hotel, with its storied past and revolving door of guests, was a treasure trove of potential suspects. Each interaction, every conversation, now held a sinister undertone. I couldn't trust anyone, the smiling faces masking intentions I dared not fathom. As my investigation deepened, the hotel transformed in my eyes. Corridors echoed with the whispers of unseen threats, and every creak of the wooden floorboards sounded like a silent alarm. I began to notice the small, almost imperceptible signs of surveillance, the misplaced books that seemed to observe more than they should, the mirrors that held too many secrets, the paintings whose eyes seemed to follow my every move. My first breakthrough came unexpectedly. While exploring the dimly lit library, a haven of dust-covered books and forgotten lore, I stumbled upon a collection of old guest registers. Buried within these pages were the names of countless souls who had passed through the hotel's doors, each carrying their own stories. It was here, among the faded ink and yellowed pages, that I found a pattern. Several guests had reported similar feelings of unease, some even mentioning the sensation of being watched. Yet these reports were casually dismissed, buried under the guise of hospitality and reassurance. Fueled by this discovery, my quest took on a new fervor. I befriended a few long-term staff members, coaxing out stories of the hotel's darker days. Whispers of a disgruntled former employee emerged, a figure shrouded in mystery and resentment. This person, I learned, had been fired under contentious circumstances and had vowed revenge against the establishment. Could this be the unseen observer, lurking within the shadows orchestrating a campaign of voyeuristic terror? Determined to face my observer, I set a trap. Using myself as bait, I pretended to retire early for the night, turning off the lights and lying in bed, my heart racing in anticipation. Hours passed, each minute stretching into eternity. Just when I began to doubt, a faint noise shattered the silence. The sound of cautious footsteps approached my room, followed by the soft click of technology being operated. 
Seizing the moment, I flicked on the lights and lunged towards the sound. There in the corridor stood a figure clad in darkness, a small remote device in hand. The face that turned towards me was familiar, one of the staff members who had feigned ignorance at my initial complaint. The shock in their eyes mirrored my own, but only for a moment. What followed was a tense confrontation, a cacophony of accusations and denials that echoed through the silent hotel. The aftermath was a blur of police lights and whispered conversations. The hidden cameras, it was revealed, were part of a sickening collection of voyeuristic footage, amassed over months by the disgruntled ex-employee. The staff member I had caught was merely a pawn, blackmailed into continuing the vile legacy. In the wake of the scandal, the hotel's reputation was irrevocably tarnished. Guests left in droves, and the whispers of the unseen observer became a cautionary tale of privacy invaded and trust betrayed. As for me, I left the city behind, seeking solace in the anonymity of crowds, forever wary of the unseen eyes that might still watch from the shadows. Story 2 The allure of the old hotel was undeniable. Nestled in the heart of a sleepy town, its walls whispered tales of days gone by, of guests whose laughter and sorrow had seeped into the very bricks. Drawn by a mix of curiosity and a yearning for something beyond the mundane, I found myself at its doorstep, eager to peel back the layers of history hidden within. My first steps into the lobby were like stepping back in time. The air was thick with the scent of aged wood and nostalgia. The decor, a testament to the hotel's storied past, seemed to hold a thousand stories, each begging to be told. It was in this state of wonder that I met the concierge, a stoic figure whose eyes held the weight of secrets untold. He handed me the key to my room with a nod, a silent invitation to explore the mysteries that lay ahead. The room was a cozy embrace of antique charm and simplicity. But as nightfall wrapped the hotel in its silent embrace, my restless spirit urged me to wander. The corridors, lit by the soft glow of flickering lamps, guided me in my aimless journey. It was a sound, a whisper of movement, that drew me to the top floor, a place where the dust spoke of long neglect. There, at the end of the hallway, stood a door unlike any other. Its wood was marked by time, the color faded, and a heavy padlock barred entry. But it was the keyhole, a narrow window into the past, that beckoned me closer. Peering through, the sight that met my eyes was a room frozen in time. Belongings were scattered in disarray, as if their owner had left in a hurry never to return. A suitcase lay open, clothes spilling out. A book lay face down, its pages yellowed by the passage of time. It was a snapshot of a moment, abruptly abandoned. The mystery consumed me, an obsession that wouldn't rest until satisfied. The next morning I approached the concierge, questions burning on my tongue. His initial reluctance was a wall, but it crumbled under the weight of my persistent curiosity. With a sigh that seemed to carry the burden of years, he shared the tale of the forgotten guest. Decades ago, a traveler had checked into the hotel, just another face among many. But as days turned to weeks, the guest became a fixture, a part of the hotel's fabric. Then, one day, they vanished. The room, untouched since that fateful day, held the remnants of a life interrupted. The concierge spoke of it as a scar, a reminder of the transient nature of existence within the hotel's walls. Fascinated and haunted in equal measure, I sought to uncover more. My inquiries led me to the town's archives, a treasure trove of forgotten history. There, amidst dusty records and faded photographs, I pieced together the life of the guest who had vanished without a trace. Known as a wanderer with no family to speak of, the guest had found a semblance of home within the hotel. But why leave, and where did they go? The intrigue of the forgotten guest's story pulled me deeper, driving me to seek answers in the most unlikely places. The townsfolk, with their memories stretching back through decades, became my unwitting guides. Among them I found whispers of a person both beloved and enigmatic, a soul who had touched lives without revealing much of their own. Their disappearance had been a wound in the town's history, one that had never quite healed. As I delved further, a picture began to form a portrait of a person fleeing not from something, but perhaps to something or someone. Clues hinted at a secret life, one filled with longing and unspoken dreams. The belongings left behind in that locked room spoke volumes letters half-written and never sent, 
photographs of places far afield, a diary with entries that hinted at a love kept hidden from judgmental eyes. My search led me back to the hotel, to the locked room that had become my obsession. With permission granted under the weight of my curiosity, the concierge unlocked the door, allowing me into a world preserved in time. The air inside was stale, thick with the echoes of a life paused. Every item was a piece of the puzzle, each book, each piece of clothing, a clue to the person who had once called this room home. I spent hours in that room, poring over the diary, the heart of my mystery. It told stories of travels and encounters, of joy found in the simple beauty of a sunset or the kindness of strangers. But more than anything, it spoke of love, a love so profound, yet so constrained by the mores of the time that it could only exist in the shadows. The entries grew more sporadic as the date of the disappearance approached, their tone tinged with desperation and a heartbreaking decision to leave, driven by the hope of finally being free to love without fear. The realization struck me with the force of a revelation. The forgotten guest hadn't vanished into thin air, they had embarked on a journey, one that promised the freedom they had longed for their entire life. This wasn't just a tale of disappearance, it was a narrative of liberation, of the courage to seek happiness against all odds. With the mystery unraveling, I felt a strange connection to the guest, as if their quest for freedom mirrored my own search for meaning. The town, with its quaint charm and layers of history, suddenly seemed like more than just a backdrop to my investigation. It was a crossroads of countless stories, each marked by joy, sorrow, and the endless pursuit of fulfillment. In the end, I realized that some stories don't have a clear conclusion. The fate of the forgotten guest remained a mystery, their final destination unknown. Yet, their story, captured in the diary and the memories of those who had known them, offered a powerful testament to the human spirit's resilience. As I prepared to leave the hotel and the town behind, I couldn't help but feel changed. The forgotten guest, with their silent room and hidden diary, had imparted a lesson that transcended time. It was a reminder that, in our pursuit of happiness, the journey itself is as important as the destination, and that freedom, in its purest form, is the freedom to be true to oneself. Story 3 Every night, as the clock's hands aligned at 3.03 a.m., an eerie silence enveloped my hotel room, broken only by the shrill ring of the phone. Each call, a silent cry from the void, left me more unsettled than the last. The room, once a haven of rest during my travels, transformed into a stage for a nightly ritual I neither understood nor welcomed. At first, I dismissed the calls as a quirk of the hotel, perhaps a faulty line or a misguided prank. But as the nights progressed, the precise timing and the unerring silence on the other end began to gnaw at my sanity. There was an intention behind the calls, a message being conveyed in the absence of words, a presence felt but not seen. I scoured the hotel for answers, each employee's denial only deepening the mystery. No records of calls made to my room, no malfunctioning equipment, nothing to explain the nightly disturbances. It wasn't until the day of my departure, bags packed and nerves frayed, that the veil was lifted. The receptionist, with a nonchalance that belied the gravity of her words, revealed the tale of my room's previous occupant. A soul tormented by chronic pain, their only solace found in the dead of night, calling the front desk at precisely 3.03 a.m., seeking relief that never came. Their passing, shrouded in the same silence that now haunted my nights, left behind a legacy of suffering and unanswered pleas. The revelation cast a shadow over my departure, the hotel's charm now tainted by the echoes of a pain so profound it transcended death. The silent phone calls, a bridge between realms, became a nightly vigil, a reminder of the fragility of life and the loneliness that binds us in our darkest hours. Driven by a need to understand and perhaps to offer solace to a soul in turmoil, I delved into the history of the occupant. Their life, marked by solitude and the relentless pursuit of relief from their torment, was a mirror to the isolation I felt in my quest for answers. As my stay extended, each night became a communion with the past. I awaited the calls with a mix of dread and anticipation, a silent listener to the pain that time could not erase. The hotel room, a witness to countless stories, now held one more a testament to the unseen battles fought in the quietest hours. In my search for peace, I found a kindred spirit in the hotel's chaplain, a keeper of secrets and a guide to the weary. Together we held a vigil, 
a ceremony of healing and release, not just for the tormented soul, but for all who sought refuge within the hotel's walls. The night of the vigil, as the clock once again struck 3.03 a.m., the phone remained silent. A calm descended, a sense of closure that whispered through the corridors and settled in the very foundations of the hotel. It was as if the building itself exhaled, releasing years of pent-up sorrow and loneliness. In the days that followed, the atmosphere of the hotel shifted subtly. The staff moved with a lighter step, the air felt less heavy, and the guests, though unaware of the change, seemed more at peace. As for me, the silent phone calls that had once been a source of dread became a poignant reminder of the connection between the living and the departed, of the pain and the stories that linger in the spaces we share. My time at the hotel eventually came to an end, but the experience left an indelible mark on my soul. I left with a deeper understanding of the unseen threads that connect us, of the silent cries for help that often go unheard, and of the healing power of acknowledgement and remembrance. The story of the silent phone calls spread quietly among the hotel's future guests, a ghost story with a twist that provoked reflection rather than fear. The room, once the source of mysterious dread, became the most requested, with guests hoping to touch the fringe of the unknown, to feel the presence of the one who had left behind a legacy of silent calls. As I ventured back into the world, the memory of those silent 3.03 a.m. calls echoed in my heart. They served as a haunting reminder of our shared humanity, of the struggles that bind us, and of the compassion that can bridge even the vastest divides. Story 4 The journey to the coastal town had been impromptu, a much-needed escape from the relentless pace of city life. The hotel, with its Victorian charm and promises of tranquility, seemed like the perfect sanctuary. However, mere hours after checking in, the idyllic setting turned into a nightmarish ordeal. It began subtly, a mild discomfort that I attributed to the fatigue of travel, but as the night progressed, my condition deteriorated rapidly. A fever engulfed me, its heat burning through my veins like wildfire. Hallucinations twisted my reality, each vision more terrifying than the last. Shadows danced along the walls, morphing into grotesque figures that whispered threats in a language I felt in my bones but could not understand. An overwhelming sense of dread settled over me, a heavy cloak that suffocated every breath. I was trapped in a hellscape of my own mind, the hotel room transforming into a prison from which there seemed no escape. The staff, when I managed to call for help, appeared distant, their faces blurring between concern and an inexplicable weariness. Their attempts at aid were futile, my body rejecting water and medicine alike. The decision to leave, born of a desperate instinct for survival, was what saved me. Stepping out of the hotel's oppressive aura, the symptoms began to wane, as if the building itself was the source of my torment. By the time I reached the safety of my car, the fever had subsided and the hallucinations faded into the harsh light of day. Confusion and a lingering fear followed me as I drove away, the hotel's facade receding in the rearview mirror, but its shadow lingering in my mind. The need to understand what had happened drove me to investigate, to seek out the history of the land on which the hotel stood. What I uncovered was a tale of sorrow and death. The hotel, in all its grandeur, was built upon the grounds of an old hospital, one that had been at the epicenter of a devastating epidemic. The disease, as virulent as it was mysterious, had claimed countless lives, its victims succumbing to fever and delirium in the very place I had chosen as my refuge. The realization sent chills down my spine. Had the suffering and despair of the past somehow imprinted itself on the present, was my illness a brush with the echoes of those who had died in agony, unable to leave the site of their demise? The questions plagued me, driving me deeper into the history of the epidemic and the hospital's desperate battle against it. The stories of doctors and nurses who fought tirelessly, of families torn apart, and of patients lost to fever dreams painted a picture of a tragedy that had left a permanent scar on the town. Determined to understand the connection between my experience and the hotel's dark past, I sought out experts in the paranormal and the history of epidemics. Each conversation added a piece to the puzzle, revealing the complex web of energy and memory that can linger in places marked by intense suffering. 
The allure of the historic hotel had been irresistible a beacon of architectural beauty and whispered secrets from the past. However, the excitement of uncovering the layers of history veiled within its walls soon turned into a harrowing ordeal. Within hours of my arrival, an unexplained malaise took hold, gripping me with a fever so intense it felt as if my very essence was burning away. The fever escalated into vivid hallucinations, each more disturbing than the last. I saw shadows moving in the corners of my eyes, heard whispers that seemed to echo from the depths of the hotel itself. The boundary between reality and the macabre fantasies conjured by my fevered mind blurred until I could no longer distinguish one from the other. But it wasn't just the physical symptoms that tormented me an overwhelming sense of dread permeated my being, as if the very soul of the hotel was warning me, urging me to flee. The decision to leave the hotel came not from a moment of clarity but from an instinctual need to survive. As I crossed the threshold, leaving the confines of the hotel behind, the symptoms that had ravaged my body and mind began to abate. The fever cooled, the hallucinations faded into the ether, and the sense of dread lifted replaced by an insatiable need for answers. My quest for understanding led me to the local archives, where the history of the land upon which the hotel stood was meticulously documented. It was there, amidst the yellowed pages of history, that I uncovered the tragic past of the site a hospital that had been at the epicenter of a devastating epidemic. The records spoke of countless lives lost of doctors and nurses who fought valiantly against an unseen enemy only to be consumed by the very illness they sought to eradicate. The parallels between my experience and the tales of suffering that filled the hospital's halls were chilling. Had I been afflicted by the residual anguish that permeated the ground, or was there something more sinister at play, a malevolent force awakened by the construction of the hotel? Determined to delve deeper, I sought out those who had been connected to the hotel since its inception. Their stories, initially reticent and cloaked in denial, gradually unfolded, revealing a tapestry of unexplained occurrences. Guests spoke of sudden illnesses, of nights tormented by nightmares that felt all too real, and of an inexplicable urge to flee. The staff, too, had their tales of rooms that seemed to chill without reason, of sounds that mimicked the agonized cries of the ill, and of shadows that moved with purpose through the halls. The realization that I was but one in a long line of individuals touched by the lingering curse of the past was both a solace and a spur to action. Armed with this knowledge, I embarked on a mission to cleanse the hotel of its haunted legacy. Collaborating with experts in the paranormal and historians alike, we conducted rituals of purification, seeking to appease the spirits that lingered and to sever the ties that bound them to this realm. The process was arduous, fraught with setbacks and moments of terror that tested our resolve, but as we persevered, a shift occurred. The atmosphere of the hotel, once oppressive and laden with sorrow, began to lighten. The reports of unexplained illnesses and disturbances dwindled, replaced by a sense of peace that had long eluded the premises. In the end, the hotel was reborn not just as a place of rest for the weary traveler, but as a monument to those who had suffered and perished on its grounds. A memorial garden was established, a serene space where guests and visitors could pay their respects and reflect on the impermanence of life and the resilience of the human spirit. Story 5 The historic hotel stood as a monument to times past, its walls echoing with the remnants of stories untold. Drawn to its antique charm and whispered legacies, I checked in, eager to immerse myself in its history. Little did I know, my fascination would soon evolve into a harrowing encounter that blurred the lines between the living and the spectral. My first night was one of restless anticipation, the room a blend of Victorian elegance and lingering mysteries. As darkness enveloped the world outside, a different kind of shadow began to seep into my room, one that was not cast by any light. The silence of the night was shattered by a persistent knocking on my door, rhythmic and insistent. Each time I rose to answer, expecting to find a guest or a member of the staff, the hallway presented itself as empty, the echo of my own confusion the only response. This pattern repeated throughout the night, a cycle of knocks and unanswered questions. Sleep became an elusive wish, and as dawn broke, the reality of my experience set in. The knocks, though devoid of a physical presence, carried a weight, a message from beyond that I could not decipher. The next day, 
Under the guise of a casual conversation, I inquired about the history of my room and its neighbors. The housekeeper, her voice a hushed whisper, revealed a tale that sent shivers down my spine. For years ago, a guest consumed by despair had wandered the halls, knocking on doors in a silent plea for help before succumbing to his own torment in the room next to mine. The tragedy had become a footnote in the hotel's storied past, yet the echoes of that desperate act seemed to linger, reaching out to the living in a relentless quest for peace. Armed with this knowledge, the persistent knocking transformed in my mind from a mere disturbance to a call to action. I felt a profound connection to the lost soul, a compulsion to understand and, if possible, to offer solace. My nights became vigils, each knock a thread in the fabric of a story that I was determined to unravel. I delved into the hotel's archives, seeking to uncover the identity of the guest and the circumstances that led to his tragic end. The more I learned, the more the lines of my own reality began to blur. The knocks, once a source of fear, became a language of their own, a bridge between worlds that I was learning to navigate. It was during one such night, as I sat awake, waiting for the inevitable knock, that a breakthrough occurred. The door, which I had left slightly ajar in a silent invitation, creaked open to reveal a figure. Not a specter from the depths of imagination, but a man, his appearance as solid and as real as my own. His eyes, though weary with the weight of unshed tears, held a spark of something unmistakable recognition. He spoke not with words but with emotions, a flood of despair and longing that I felt as my own. In that moment, I understood the true nature of the knocking. It was not a haunt but a remembrance, a plea for acknowledgement and release from the chains of regret that bound him. With a resolve that mirrored the intensity of the knocks, I set about crafting a ritual of release. Guided by the wisdom of those who had tread similar paths between the worlds, I sought to offer the guest the peace he had been denied in life. The hotel, with its history of both joy and sorrow, became the stage for a ceremony that transcended the boundaries of time and existence. As the ritual reached its crescendo, the air around us thickened, the past and present melding into a single point of convergence. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the knocking ceased. The figure before me, a man who had known nothing but torment in his final moments, smiled a gesture of gratitude and liberation before fading into the ether. The nights that followed were silent, the knocking a memory of a journey that had led me through the depths of despair to the heights of understanding. The hotel, once a mere shelter for the night, became a testament to the power of compassion and the indomitable will of the human spirit to seek connection and closure. In the aftermath, I found myself changed. No longer merely a guest passing through, I had become a part of the hotel's legacy, a bridge between the seen and the unseen. The story of the persistent knocking and the peace that followed would be etched into its walls, a whisper among the many that filled its halls. The historic hotel, with its grandiose facade and whispers of the past, held an allure that I found irresistible. Drawn by tales of its storied inhabitants and timeless charm, I checked in, seeking both solace and inspiration. My first night, however, unfolded into an experience far removed from the peaceful retreat I had envisioned. As the clock heralded the arrival of midnight, a persistent knocking at my door fractured the silence. Each rhythmic rap was deliberate, a demand for attention that sent a ripple of unease through my already tense frame. With cautious steps, I approached, only to find the hallway deserted, the echo of my own heartbeat the only reply to my queries. This pattern repeated, a relentless cycle that eroded my nerves and fueled a growing dread within me. The morning light brought no relief, only the revelation of a chilling backstory whispered by a long-serving housekeeper. Years ago, a troubled soul had wandered these very halls, knocking on doors in a silent plea for help or perhaps connection, before succumbing to his despair in the room adjacent to mine. The knowledge that tragedy had unfolded so close to where I lay sleeping cast a shadow over the hotel's opulent beauty, transforming it into a mausoleum of unspoken sorrows. Driven by a mix of fear and fascination, I delved into the history of the unfortunate guest. His was a tale of loss and isolation, a life unraveled by the threads of tragedy and culminating in a desperate act that left a permanent scar on the hotel's legacy. 
The more I uncovered, the more the knocking seemed less an annoyance and more a manifestation of unresolved agony, reaching across the chasm of time for acknowledgement. The encounters grew in intensity, each night marked by the ominous knocking, now accompanied by fleeting shadows and whispers carried on the wind. Sleep became an elusive companion, replaced by a vigilance born of the fear that I might unravel the mystery only to lose myself in the process. It was in this state of heightened awareness that I experienced a night unlike any other. The knocking, now familiar yet no less terrifying, was joined by a voice, a murmured plea barely discernible above the thumping of my own heart. Help me, it implored, a simple request laden with despair. Compelled by a newfound resolve, I sought to bridge the gap between the living and the lost. Enlisting the help of a medium, a guide versed in the language of spirits, we embarked on a journey to provide solace to the restless soul. The seance held in the room where the guest had met his tragic end was a convergence of energies, a beacon for the troubled spirit that had so disrupted my stay. As the medium invoked the presence of the guest, the air grew thick, charged with anticipation and the weight of unspoken histories. The knocking, a constant companion over the past night's crescendo to a climax, then ceased abruptly, as if awaiting the final act of a long unfolding drama. Through the medium, the guest spoke. His words, though laden with sorrow, carried a plea for understanding, for the release from the chains of regret that bound him to the earthy plane. It was a tale of mistakes and missed connections, of a life ended too soon and a soul too burdened to move on. Moved by his story, we offered words of forgiveness and peace, a litany of hope and release. As the ritual concluded, a palpable sense of relief filled the room, an unspoken acknowledgement that the guest had found the solace he so desperately sought. In the days that followed, the hotel returned to a semblance of normalcy. The knocking ceased, the shadows receded, and the whispers faded into memory. Guests and staff alike noted a change in the atmosphere, a lifting of the oppressive weight that had lingered for years. The hotel, once a prison for a soul in torment, became a beacon of peace, its halls no longer haunted by the echoes of past despair. And as for me, my journey into the unknown had not only uncovered a tale of sorrow but had also revealed the power of compassion and the enduring connection between the living and the spirits that walk among us. Story 6 The hotel stood as a testament to an era long past, its walls steeped in history and whispered tales of bygone guests. My fascination with such relics of the past had led me here, to a place where every creaking floorboard and flickering light seemed to tell a story. My room, with its antique furnishings and air of genteel decay, was no exception. It was here, amid the faded grandeur, that my curiosity uncovered a secret long concealed by the passage of time. The discovery came by chance, a result of a misplaced suitcase and the subsequent search for lost space. Behind the wardrobe, obscured by the shadows and years of neglect, was a door. Its existence was a siren call to my curious soul, a promise of hidden truths and untold stories. With a mix of trepidation and excitement, I embarked on a journey into the unknown. The passage, narrow and cloaked in dust, twisted like a serpent through the bowels of the hotel. It led me, heart pounding with anticipation, to a small, forgotten room. This hidden sanctum, a time capsule of a life interrupted, was filled with personal items shrouded in the cobwebs of abandonment. Among the relics of a life once lived, I found a diary, its pages yellowed with age but the words within still vibrant with emotion. The diary belonged to a woman a member of the family that had once owned the hotel. Her words painted a portrait of a life marred by tragedy and solitude, born into privilege, but afflicted with a malady that rendered her an outcast in her own family. She was hidden away, locked within the confines of this secret room. Her existence, a blemish on the family's esteemed lineage, was to be erased, her voice silenced by the walls that imprisoned her. As I delved deeper into her writings, I was drawn into the world of a soul who sought solace in the written word, her diary a testament to the human spirit's resilience. She spoke of her dreams, her fears, and the love she held for a world she could only experience through the narrow lens of her confinement. Her life, a tapestry of sorrow interwoven with threads of unyielding hope, was a poignant reminder of the invisible chains that bind us. The diary's final entries, heart-wrenching in their despair, 
detailed her realization that she would never escape her gilded cage. Yet even as the light of hope dimmed, she clung to the belief that one day someone would find her diary and her story would be told. Emerging from the passage, the diary clutched in my hands. I was overwhelmed by a sense of duty to the forgotten woman who had become my silent confidante. Her story, a mirror to the darkest aspects of human nature, was also a beacon of the enduring desire for recognition and remembrance. Compelled by her words, I embarked on a quest to bring her story to light. My inquiries led me to descendants of the hotel's original owners, to historians who could piece together the fragments of her existence, and to others who, like me, were drawn to the echoes of the past that lingered in the hotel's halls. The revelation of her story sparked a wave of interest, transforming the hotel from a mere relic of the past to a place of pilgrimage for those who sought to honor her memory. The hidden room, once a prison, became a shrine to her life and legacy, a tangible connection to a woman who, in her isolation, had touched the heart of a stranger. In the end, the hidden passage was more than just a tale of discovery, it was a journey of redemption, both for the woman who had been locked away and forgotten and for those who had forgotten her. Her diary, a vessel of her hopes and sorrows, became a symbol of the power of storytelling to transcend time and space, to transform forgotten whispers into voices that resonate through the ages. Story 7 It was supposed to be a retreat, a much-needed escape from the cacophony of my regular life. The quaint hotel nestled in the heart of the old town seemed like the perfect sanctuary. Its walls, steeped in history, whispered tales of yesteryear, promising solace and perhaps a hint of mystery. Little did I know, my stay would be anything but ordinary. The journey there was uneventful, a serene drive through winding roads, flanked by towering trees whose leaves danced in the gentle breeze. As I arrived, the hotel loomed before me, its facade a beautiful tapestry of architectural prowess from a bygone era. The reception was warm, almost too warm, as if they were expecting me, or perhaps someone, anyone, to break the monotony of their day. My room was on the top floor, for the best view the manager had said with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. The elevator creaked and groaned as it ascended, a foreboding prelude to what was to come. The hallway to my room was dimly lit, the carpet a deep red, worn by countless footsteps over the years. My room, however, was a stark contrast bright and airy, with a large window offering a panoramic view of the old town. It was charming, and for a moment I felt at peace. The day passed uneventfully, filled with leisurely walks and quiet contemplation. As night fell, I found myself drawn to the solitude of my room, the comfort of the soft bed too enticing to ignore. Sleep, however, proved elusive. There was a restlessness in the air, a tension that seemed to seep from the very walls. Deciding a warm shower might ease my unease, I made my way to the bathroom, the chill of the tiles a stark contrast to the warmth that enveloped me as the water cascaded down. The steam filled the room, creating a cocoon of warmth. It was comforting, almost too comforting, lulling me into a false sense of security. As I turned off the water and reached for the towel, a sense of dread washed over me. The steam had fogged up the mirror, save for a small, clear patch at the center. Compelled by a force I couldn't understand, I wiped the mirror with my hand, clearing the steam. The reflection that greeted me was not my own. A face twisted in sorrow and anguish, stared back at me, eyes hollow and filled with an unspeakable pain, bore into mine. For a moment time stood still, the silence of the room punctuated only by the beating of my heart. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, the face vanished, leaving me staring at my own bewildered expression in the mirror. Shaken, I stumbled out of the bathroom, the comfort of the bed now a distant memory. My mind raced, trying to rationalize what I had seen. Was it a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination perhaps, spurred by the stories the walls whispered? I couldn't tell. Resuming from where we left off, the encounter in the bathroom left me with an unshakable sense of foreboding. Sleep was an impossibility, now my mind was a whirlwind of questions with no answers. 
The image of the sorrowful face haunted me, its eyes a mirror to a soul tormented by an agony I could scarcely comprehend. In a desperate attempt to find clarity, I decided to venture out of my room. The hotel, bathed in the soft glow of the night lights, felt different now. The once comforting silence now seemed to echo with whispers of secrets long kept. My steps led me, almost unconsciously, down to the lobby where the night shift manager, a different person from the one who greeted me upon arrival, manned the front desk. He looked up, surprised to see a guest at this late hour. Can I help you? He asked, his voice a blend of curiosity and concern. I, I had an experience I began, struggling to find the words to describe the encounter without sounding absurd. In my bathroom, I saw a reflection in the mirror. It wasn't mine. His reaction was not what I expected. There was no confusion, no skepticism, only a dawning realization, as if my experience confirmed something he already suspected. He motioned for me to follow him to a more secluded part of the lobby, away from the ears of any wandering night owls. Room 407, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. You're not the first. My heart skipped a beat. What do you mean? He sighed, a weight seemingly lifted from his shoulders as he began to share the tale. Many years ago, the room was occupied by a young woman, a traveler like myself. She checked in but never checked out. Her story was a tragic one. Heartbroken over a love lost, her sorrow became too much to bear. One night, she took her own life in that very room. Ever since, guests have reported strange occurrences, fleeting reflections, sudden drops in temperature, and an inexplicable sense of sadness. The revelation sent shivers down my spine. The face in the mirror had to be hers. But why appear to me? What did she want? I returned to my room, the manager's story replaying in my mind. The comfort it once offered was now gone, replaced by a cold eeriness. Lying in bed, I stared at the ceiling, pondering the woman's fate and the profound loneliness she must have felt in her final moments. As dawn approached, an idea took root. Maybe she didn't want to be forgotten. Perhaps in revealing herself, she sought acknowledgement, a recognition of her pain in existence. With the first light of day piercing the darkness, I made my way back to the bathroom. The mirror, now clear, seemed just an ordinary piece of glass. Yet the air felt different, charged with an unseen energy. I see you, I whispered, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. I don't know your name, but I see your pain. You're not forgotten. The atmosphere shifted, a sense of peace settling over the room. It was as if acknowledging her presence, her story, had granted her some solace, a step towards the peace she had been denied in life. The remainder of my stay passed without incident. The manager offered to move me to a different room, but I declined. Leaving felt like abandoning her, and after our silent communion, it was something I couldn't bring myself to do. Upon checkout, the manager caught my eye, a wordless exchange that conveyed a mutual understanding. The woman's story, her pain and her longing for acknowledgement had woven us together in the tapestry of human empathy. As I drove away from the hotel, the old town fading in my rearview mirror, I couldn't help but feel changed. The encounter had been a reminder of the unseen struggles all around us, the silent pleas for recognition and remembrance. In acknowledging her, I had not only given her peace but had also found a measure of my own. Story 8 The quaint charm of the boutique hotel was undeniable, nestled at the edge of a sleepy town surrounded by undulating hills. It promised a tranquil getaway from the hustle and bustle of city life, an artist's retreat where one could bask in the serene beauty of nature and perhaps find inspiration in its quietude. My room was cozy, with a large window framing the picturesque landscape beyond. But what caught my eye was the artwork adorning the walls paintings of landscapes that seemed almost alive in their beauty and detail. The paintings, I was told, were the works of a local artist renowned for his ability to capture the essence of the town's landscapes. He has a unique touch the hotel owner had said with a note of pride. His art brings the walls to life. Indeed, the art did more than just adorn the walls, it felt like windows into another world, one of tranquil fields, dense forests, and serene lakes. 
Each painting beckoned with a promise of stories untold, landscapes untouched by the woes of the world outside. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, I found myself drawn to one painting in particular. It depicted a forest at dusk, the trees casting long shadows that stretched across a meadow. In the fading light, the trees took on a semblance of life, their branches like arms reaching out to the heavens. But as night enveloped the room, the painting began to change. Or so it seemed in the dim light cast by the bedside lamp. The trees, once majestic in their stillness, now appeared twisted and gnarled, like contorted figures trapped in an eternal scream. The serene meadow was now a dark expanse, hinting at unseen horrors lurking just beyond the reach of light. I chalked it up to the play of shadows in my overactive imagination, a side effect of too many horror stories consumed over the years. Yet, sleep proved elusive, the unsettling transformation of the artwork etching itself into my thoughts. The following day I sought solace in the town, wandering its quaint streets and basking in the simplicity of life that seemed to flow unhurriedly here. The daytime brought a sense of normalcy, the disturbing visions of the night before fading like mist under the morning sun. But with the return of night, the paintings transformed once again. The serene lake and another painting now appeared blood red under the moon's glow, the water still and menacing. A sense of unease grew within me, a feeling that something was terribly wrong, not just with the paintings, but with the very fabric of this place. Driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, I approached the hotel owner the next morning, inquiring about the artist behind the Yuri artworks. Oh yes, the artist, he began, his voice tinged with a sadness I hadn't noticed before. A troubled soul, consumed by visions that haunted his every waking moment. They say he painted not what he saw, but what he felt the beauty of the landscapes marred by the horrors of his mind. The revelation was a jolt, casting the paintings in a new, sinister light. The artwork wasn't just the product of a gifted artist, but a window into a tormented psyche, a manifestation of inner demons that clawed at the edges of reality. Resuming the tale of the unsettling artwork, the revelation about the artist sent a chill down my spine, turning my fascination with the paintings into a deep-seated unease. The knowledge that each brushstroke was born not from peaceful contemplation, but from a mind besieged by darkness added a palpable tension to the air. The artworks were no longer mere decorations, they were silent witnesses to a struggle between beauty and horror. Determined to understand more, I sought out locals who might shed light on the artist's story. In a small cafe, over cups of coffee that did little to ward off the chill of the unfolding tale, an elderly patron shared the tragic history of the artist, a man named Edward Malin. Edward was a prodigy, blessed with a talent that could evoke the deepest emotions through his landscapes the man began his voice carrying the weight of unspoken sorrow. But his gift was a double-edged sword. The same sensitivity that allowed him to see beauty in the ordinary also made him susceptible to visions so terrifying, they drove him to the brink. As the man spoke, images of Edward's paintings flashed through my mind, each now tainted with the knowledge of the agony that birthed them. The twisted trees, the blood-red lake they were not products of imagination but manifestations of Edward's inner turmoil, his canvas a battlefield where he fought his demons in the only way he knew how. Did he find no relief from his visions, I asked, a part of me hoping for a sliver of redemption in this tale of woe. The man shook his head, his eyes reflecting a sorrow that seemed to stretch back through the years. Some battles are too great for one soul to bear. Edward sought solace in his art, but the visions only grew more intense, more horrifying. In the end, he could no longer distinguish between reality and the nightmares that plagued him. The story haunted me as I returned to the hotel, the once charming building now a mausoleum housing the echoes of Edward's torment. The paintings that adorned my room seemed to watch me, their landscapes a testament to a war waged in the recesses of the mind. That night, the transformation of the artworks reached a new peak of horror. The twisted figures in the trees appeared to move, their limbs swaying in a grotesque dance. The blood-red lake bubbled and churned as if alive. I realized then that Edward's visions were not confined to his mind, they had seeped into his creations, imbuing them with a life of their own. Fueled by a mix of fear and determination, I decided to confront the horrors head-on. 
As midnight approached, I sat before the painting of the forest, forcing myself to stare into the twisted visage of the trees. I see you, I whispered, not to the painting, but to the spirit of the man who created it. I see your pain, your struggle. The words felt inadequate, a feeble attempt to bridge the gap between my reality and the abyss that had consumed Edward. Yet, as I spoke, a subtle shift occurred. The air in the room grew lighter, the oppressive sense of dread lifting ever so slightly. Over the next few nights, I continued my vigil, speaking to Edward through his art. I shared stories of my own struggles, my own moments of despair. With each word, the sinister aspect of the paintings dimmed, the landscapes regaining some of their original beauty. On my last night at the hotel, I stood before the paintings, marveling at the transformation. The twisted figures had receded, and the lake had returned to a serene blue. It was as if, in acknowledging Edward's torment, I had allowed him a measure of peace, freeing his art from the chains of his visions. As I left the hotel the following morning, the sun breaking over the horizon promised a new day. Not just for me, but I hoped for Edward too. The paintings I left behind were a testament to the complexity of the human mind, a reminder that beauty and horror are often two sides of the same coin. In sharing my own vulnerabilities, I had touched something universal, a shared longing for understanding and acceptance. Edward's art, once a source of fear, had become a bridge connecting two souls across the chasm of time and experience. Story 9 The decision to stay at the historic hotel was an impulse, driven by a desire for solitude and perhaps a touch of curiosity about the past. The building's history as a former asylum was a footnote in the brochure, glossed over with images of renovated rooms and testimonials of its charm. Yet, as I stood before its imposing structure, the weight of its past seemed to loom over me, an unspoken promise of stories buried within its walls. My room was a study in contrast modern comforts nestled within century-old masonry. The thick walls, designed to silence the tumult of troubled minds, now whispered echoes of a bygone era. It was in this setting, under the guise of tranquility, that I encountered the inexplicable. The first night passed unevently until the early hours before dawn when I awoke to a sound that chilled me to my core. It was a sobbing, so profound and filled with anguish that it seemed to seep through the very fabric of the room. I sat up, my heart racing as I scanned the darkness, searching for the source of the cries. Yet the room remained empty, the sound fading as quickly as it had appeared, leaving behind a silence that felt almost oppressive in its heaviness. Convinced my mind was playing tricks, I tried to dismiss the incident as a dream, the product of a restless sleep, but the sobbing returned the next night, and the night after that, each time more desperate, more heart-wrenching. It was as if the walls themselves were crying, the sorrows of the past unable to be contained by stone and mortar. Compelled by a mix of fear and a need to understand, I sought out the hotel staff, inquiring about the history of my room. The answers came reluctantly, the current owners distant from the building's original purpose. Yet, bits and pieces of the truth began to emerge from their hesitant words and the avoidance in their eyes. The hotel, in its previous incarnation as an asylum, had been a place of profound suffering. Patients, misunderstood and mistreated by the standards of the time, had been subjected to therapies that were little more than torture. My room, it turned out, had been part of a ward known for its particularly tragic cases, souls who had endured unimaginable torment. With this knowledge, the cries took on a new dimension. They were no longer just sounds in the night, but cries for help from those long gone, their pain etched into the very essence of the place. I was sleeping amidst their anguish, an unwitting witness to the echoes of their despair. Determined to uncover more, I delved into the asylum's history each detail painting a picture of a place not of healing but of isolation and suffering. The cries at night, once a source of fear, now stirred a deep sadness within me. The walls, witnesses to so much pain, seemed to mourn the souls who had passed through, their stories untold, their suffering unseen. Armed with the sorrowful legacy of the hotel's origins, my nights became a vigil. The cries, once a source of dread, now evoked a deep empathy. It was as if by listening, I acknowledged their existence, their suffering, and offered a semblance of the comfort they were denied in life. Yet the question remained, how could I, 
a solitary visitor tethered to the present, provides solace to souls adrift in the echoes of the past. My quest for answers led me to the local archives, where dusty tomes and faded documents whispered secrets of the asylum's history. Among the tales of despair, a pattern emerged stories of individuals who, despite their circumstances, sought to reach out, to connect, to be heard. It was a reminder that at the heart of the asylum's tragedy were human beings, each with their own story, their own unmet needs for compassion and understanding. One story, in particular, struck a chord that of a young woman named Eliza, known for her nightly weeping. Records indicated she had been committed by a family embarrassed by her hysterical fits a common refrain for any behavior deemed inconvenient at the time. The treatments inflicted upon her were designed to silence her, to erase her from the narrative of her own life. Eliza's story resonated with me, a tangible thread linking the cries in the night to a real person who had lived and suffered within these walls. It was her voice, I realized, that called out from the darkness, a cry for help that had gone unanswered for far too long. Driven by a newfound purpose, I sought to honor Eliza's memory and, by extension, the memories of all who had suffered alongside her. I arranged for a small plaque to be placed in the hotel, a token of recognition for the building's history and its hidden stories. It was a small gesture, but one that acknowledged their existence, their pain, and the injustice they had endured. The plaque became a focal point for guests and staff, a reminder of the past that shaped the present. Stories began to surface, not just of suffering but of resilience, of moments of kindness in a place where cruelty was the norm. The hotel, once a symbol of isolation, became a place of connection, where the past was honored and the stories of those who had suffered were brought into the light. As my stay drew to a close, the cries in the night began to fade. Whether it was the act of acknowledgement, the sharing of their stories, or simply the passage of time, the atmosphere in the hotel shifted. The heavy air of sorrow lifted, replaced by a sense of peace, as if the souls that had lingered were finally able to find rest. On my last night, the silence was profound, a testament to the journey from fear to understanding. I realized then that the cries for help were not just calls of anguish, but invitations to connect, to remember and to honor the humanity that persists even in the darkest of circumstances. Leaving the hotel, I looked back at the plaque, a beacon of memory in a world too often eager to forget. It was a reminder that though we cannot change the past, we have the power to shape how it is remembered, to offer compassion where there was none, and to ensure that cries for help are met not with silence, but with action. Story 10 the road trip had been a spur-of-the-moment decision, an escape from the monotony and pressures of daily life. Alex, my closest friend since childhood, was my companion on this adventure. We had laughed and sung along to our favorite songs, the open road before us filled with promise and possibilities. Our destination was a small, picturesque hotel in a sleepy town that seemed frozen in time, its charm undeniable. Upon arrival, we were greeted by the warm smiles of the hotel staff, their hospitality a welcome balm after the long drive. Our room was a quaint, comfortable space with two beds and a view of the hotel's lush gardens. It felt like a haven, a place where we could unwind and explore at our leisure. The first few days were blissful. We explored the town, its cobblestone streets whispering tales of history and mystery, and we indulged in local cuisine each meal a celebration of flavors. At night, we would share stories of our day's adventures, our laughter filling the room. It was a perfect escape, a memory in the making that promised to be cherished. However, the tranquility of our getaway was shattered one night. After a day filled with exploration and a hearty dinner, exhaustion claimed me and I fell into a deep sleep. When I awoke the next morning, the room was bathed in the soft light of dawn but an eerie silence pervaded the space. Alex's bed was made, its sheets tucked neatly, an empty shell. Their belongings were gone, the room stripped of any evidence of their presence. Confusion and panic set in as I searched the room, but it was clear Alex had vanished without a trace. Rushing to the front desk, my mind raced with possibilities kidnapping, a sudden departure, an accident. Yet nothing could have prepared me for the staff's response. With polite confusion, they insisted I had checked in alone. 
No record of Alex's stay existed, not in the registry, nor in the memories of the staff who had welcomed us with such warmth. The disbelief and shock were palpable. I recounted our arrival, our days spent in the town, conversations with the staff details that painted a vivid picture of two friends on a journey. Yet, their insistence remained unshaken. To them, Alex was a figment of my imagination, a story without substance. Desperation led me to scour the town, showing Alex's photo to anyone who would spare a moment. But each inquiry met the same baffling response, no recognition, no memory of Alex ever being part of this place. The hotel room felt alien now, a space haunted by the presence of someone who, according to the world, had never been there. The sense of isolation was overwhelming, a solitary confinement within a reality that refused to acknowledge my truth. Driven by a blend of desperation and disbelief, I turned to the police, hoping for some acknowledgement, some validation of Alex's existence. Yet their response mirrored that of the hotel staff and the townspeople polite skepticism veiled thinly with concern for my well-being. According to them, and the evidence before us, Alex was a figment of my imagination, a companion conjured up by a mind under stress. The days that followed were a blur of fruitless searches and sleepless nights. The hotel room, once a shared space filled with laughter and camaraderie, now felt oppressively empty. It was a constant, silent rebuke to my memories, each perfectly made bed a reminder of the world's refusal to acknowledge Alex's existence. As the weight of solitude and dismissal pressed down on me, a sliver of doubt crept in. Had I imagined the entire experience, was Alex a manifestation of a desire for escape so strong that it had conjured a companion from the ether of my mind? No, the memories were too vivid, too filled with the minutiae of shared experiences. The way Alex laughed, the stories we exchanged, the plans we made, they were too real to be mere fabrications. In a final, desperate attempt to find some shred of evidence, I broke into the hotel's office late one night, searching for any record of Alex's stay. What I found instead was a history of the hotel that hinted at a darker, more inexplicable phenomenon. The hotel, it turned out, had been the site of numerous unexplained disappearances over the years. Guests would vanish without a trace, their existence erased from records and memories alike. It was as if the hotel itself could swallow people whole, leaving behind nothing but questions that no one remembered to ask. This revelation brought no solace, only a deepening of the mystery. How could a place erase people so completely? And why was I spared the same fate? Theories abounded in the dusty files curses parallel dimensions, a sentient building feeding on the lives of its guests. Each explanation was more fantastical than the last, but in the face of my impossible situation, they held a strange sort of logic. My search for Alex became a quest for understanding, a way to fight against the erasure that had claimed my friend. I documented every moment, every memory, in exhaustive detail, refusing to let the hotel claim Alex's existence as it had so many others. In time, my search brought me into contact with others who had experienced similar losses, a small community of the forgotten and the erased, Together, we pieced together the stories of those who had vanished, creating a tapestry of memories in defiance of the hotel's unexplained power. The hotel, for its part, remained an enigma, its walls silent keepers of secrets that stretched back decades. My stay there ended, but my search for Alex, and for answers, did not. I left with more questions than when I arrived, but armed with a determination to keep the memories alive, to resist the erasure that seemed to be the hotel's true legacy. As I drove away, the hotel fading in my rearview mirror, I realized that this experience had changed me in ways I could never have anticipated. The search for Alex had evolved into a broader fight against oblivion, a refusal to let go of those we love, even in the face of a one world that tells us they never existed. Story 11 The allure of the historic hotel was irresistible, its grandeur and charm a perfect escape from the mundanity of everyday life. Nestled in a quiet part of town, it promised to stay wrapped in luxury and tranquility. My room, a spacious suite with elegant furnishings, seemed to welcome me into its embrace, a haven from the world outside. However, the charm of the room was marred by an unsettling detail I noticed on my first night a series of dark, 
irregular stains on the carpet near the foot of the bed. I was certain they hadn't been there when I checked in, a discrepancy that sent a ripple of unease through me. I brushed it off as an oversight, perhaps a spill that had gone unnoticed by the cleaning staff. By the next morning, the stains had faded from my mind, overshadowed by the day's adventures in the town's quaint streets and the hotel's luxurious amenities. Yet, as night fell and I returned to my room, the stains seemed not only to have returned but to have grown in both size and darkness. This time, there was no denying their presence or the cold shiver that ran down my spine at the sight. I called the front desk, inquiring about the possibility of changing rooms, but was met with polite apologies the hotel was fully booked. They promised a thorough cleaning the next day, assurances that did little to ease the growing sense of dread that settled over me. <laughs> True to their word, the cleaning staff attended to the room, yet each night, the stains returned, larger and more ominous than before. What was more disturbing was the staff's reaction, or rather, the lack thereof. They seemed oblivious to the stain's existence, brushing off my concerns with smiles and reassurances that all was well. Driven by a mix of curiosity and horror, I took it upon myself to investigate. The town's library held archives of local newspapers, where I hoped to find any clue that might shed light on the mystery of the stains. Hours of searching led me to a chilling discovery, a yellowed article detailing a gruesome crime that had taken place in the very room I was staying in. Decades ago, it had been the scene of a violent struggle, the floor soaked in the blood of the unfortunate victim. The knowledge that I had been sleeping mere feet from where such a tragedy had occurred filled me with a horror that was palpable. The stains, it seemed, were a macabre reminder of the room's dark past, seeping through the very fibers of the carpet as if the building itself refused to forget the violence it had witnessed. The realization that my room was the site of a long-ago crime, a place where life had been brutally extinguished, cast a shadow over my stay. The once comforting confines of the hotel now felt oppressive, each creak and whisper of the ancient building a reminder of the horror that had unfolded within its walls. Yet, a part of me was driven to understand, to uncover the full story behind the crime and the stains that seemed to defy explanation. The article had provided details of the crime but said little of the aftermath, the resolution, or the identity of those involved. It was as if the incident had been erased from the town's collective memory, mentioned only in hushed tones and quickly forgotten. Determined to delve deeper, I reached out to local historians and even descendants of the hotel's original owners. Their stories painted a picture of a tragedy that had rocked the small community, a senseless act of violence that left a scar on the hotel's storied history. The victim, a young woman visiting the town for a retreat, had been beloved by all who knew her, her death a wound that never fully healed. The perpetrator, it was revealed, was a transient with no connections to the town, his motives as dark and unfathomable as the stains that now marred my room. Who had convicted and long since passed, his legacy was one of pain and fear, a specter that haunted the hotel despite efforts to move beyond the past. Armed with this knowledge, my nights in the room took on a new dimension. The stains, growing larger with each passing day, seemed to be more than just remnants of a physical act. They were manifestations of the trauma and sorrow that had soaked into the very foundation of the building. I began to document the changes, photographing the stains each night as they spread across the carpet, an eerie, creeping blight that no amount of cleaning could erase. My sleep became fitful, plagued by nightmares of shadows and whispers in the dark, the line between the past and the present blurring until I was no longer certain where one ended and the other began. In a last-ditch effort to find peace, I decided to conduct a small ceremony in the room, a way to acknowledge the tragedy and perhaps offer some solace to the lingering remnants of that night. I spoke words of comfort and remembrance, lighting a candle in memory of the young woman whose life had been so cruelly cut short. The night that followed was the first in which the stains did not grow. Whether it was the act of remembrance, the acknowledgement of the past, or simply the power of belief, the room felt different, lighter. The oppressive atmosphere that had weighed so heavily upon me lifted replaced by a sense of calm, if not closure. On the morning of my departure, the stains were noticeably fainter, as if they, too, had begun to find peace. As I checked out of the hotel, I couldn't help but feel that my stay, though marked by darkness, 
had brought some measure of light to a place long shadowed by tragedy. Story 12 The allure of the unknown has always been a powerful force in my life, drawing me towards the mysteries that lurk just beneath the surface of our everyday reality. This insatiable curiosity led me to choose a hotel steeped in history for my latest getaway, a place rumored to be a treasure trove of untold stories and hidden secrets. The hotel did not disappoint, its Victorian architecture and antique furnishings speaking of a bygone era filled with elegance and intrigue. My room, a cozy space adorned with period pieces, seemed to whisper secrets of its past occupants. It was here, on my first night, that my quest for the unknown took an unexpected turn. While searching for an extra blanket, I discovered an old dust-covered suitcase hidden under the bed. It was an anachronism, its leather surface worn, and its metal fixtures tarnished with age. Driven by a mix of excitement and apprehension, I examined the suitcase more closely. It was locked, but the mechanism was old, and after some fiddling, yielded to my efforts. What I found inside sent a chill down my spine and set the course for the rest of my stay. The suitcase was filled with letters, each penned with an urgency that bordered on frenzy. The handwriting, elegant at first, became increasingly erratic as the letters progressed. They detailed the writer's experiences in the hotel, beginning with mundane observations but quickly descending into a narrative of paranoia and fear. The author spoke of being watched, of whispers in the dark and shadows that moved just beyond the corner of their eye. Each letter was a snapshot of a mind slowly unraveling, a descent into madness that was both fascinating and horrifying in equal measure. I emerged from my reading with a heavy heart, the weight of the writer's torment pressing down on me. Questions swirled in my mind. Who was this person? What had they experienced in this hotel to drive them to such depths of despair? Seeking answers, I approached the hotel staff with the suitcase but was met with dismissals and denials. They claimed ignorance of any such item ever being found in the hotel. Their responses rehearsed and devoid of genuine concern. It was as if the very mention of the suitcase and its contents was taboo, a subject best left unexplored. <laughs> Undeterred, I delved deeper into the hotel's history, uncovering tales of unexplained occurrences and guests who left with haunted looks in their eyes. The more I learned, the more I felt the weight of unseen eyes upon me, a sensation that grew with each passing day. The once comforting confines of my room now felt oppressive, the shadows cast by the flickering light of the bedside lamp seeming to hide whispered threats. As the days passed, the sense of being watched intensified. I would wake in the night to the feeling of a presence in the room, a pressure on the edge of my bed as if someone had just risen from it. The letters from the suitcase haunted my dreams, their words echoing in my mind, a chorus of paranoia and fear that seemed to seep into the very walls of the hotel. The discovery of the old, locked suitcase under the bed in my hotel room piqued a curiosity that I couldn't ignore. The suitcase itself was a relic, its leather surface worn and dust covered, suggesting it had lain forgotten for years, perhaps decades. The lock, rusty and resistant at first, gave way under my persistent efforts, revealing its long-held secrets. Inside, I found a stack of letters, their yellowed pages brittle with age. The handwriting was erratic, the ink faded but still legible. The letters chronicled the experiences of a previous guest of the hotel, a person who had arrived full of hope and excitement, but had gradually descended into a state of confusion and despair. As I read through the letters, a chilling narrative unfolded. The guest, whose name was never mentioned, began to notice subtle changes in the hotel and its staff. Familiar faces turned strange, hallways seemed to lengthen inexplicably, and whispers filled the air, their sources always just out of sight. With each letter, the sense of unease grew, morphing into a conviction that something unseen was watching, waiting. The final letter was the most disturbing. It spoke of visions in the night, of shadows that moved of their own accord and whispers that grew into cacophonous voices, driving the guests to the brink of madness. The writing ended abruptly, the last few sentences trailing off into unintelligible scribbles. Shaken by the contents of the suitcase, I approached the hotel staff, seeking answers, or, at the very least, some acknowledgement of the suitcase's existence. Their denial was firm, almost rehearsed, 
as they insisted no such item had been found in the hotel for as long as they could remember. The more I pressed, the more evasive they became, their polite smiles failing to mask the unease that flickered in their eyes. The feeling of being watched, which had been a mere whisper of unease as I read through the letters, grew into an oppressive certainty. My room, once a cozy retreat, now felt like a stage, every movement and sound amplified as if observed by an unseen audience. Shadows seemed to linger longer than they should, and the silence of the night was punctuated by sounds that had no source, echoes of the madness detailed in the letters. Driven by a need for answers, I began my own investigation into the hotel's history, delving into local archives and speaking with longtime residents of the town. The hotel, it turned out, had a past shrouded in mystery and tragedy. Stories of disappearances, unexplained phenomena, and guests driven to the edge of sanity by unseen forces were whispered about but never openly acknowledged. The suitcase and its letters, I realized, were not merely forgotten relics but pieces of a puzzle that stretched back through the decades, each guest's experience a thread in the fabric of the hotel's dark history. The realization that I was now part of that history, another guest ensnared by the hotel's enigmatic past, was both terrifying and compelling. As my stay drew to a close, the sense of being watched never abated. If anything, it grew stronger, a palpable presence that followed me through the hotel's hallways and lingered at the edges of my vision. On my final night, I awoke to find the suitcase open on the floor, the letters scattered around it as if someone or something had been perusing them in my absence. Leaving the hotel felt like an escape, a narrow evasion of a fate that had claimed others before me. The suitcase and its letters remained behind, a choice born of self-preservation rather than cowardice. To take them would be to invite the madness they contained into my life, a risk I was not willing to take. The locked suitcase became a story I shared with caution, a tale of curiosity, discovery, and the unknown forces that reside in the places we least expect. It was a reminder that some secrets are best left undiscovered, their truths too heavy to bear. Story 13 The hotel stood as a beacon of elegance amid the hustle of the city, its history woven into the very fabric of the neighborhood. It promised to stay replete with luxury and serenity, a promise that, until that fateful night, seemed to be kept. My stay had been uneventful, filled with the mundane activities of a business trip, until I found myself standing before the elevator late one evening, the digital numbers above the door heralding its descent. The doors slid open with a soft ding, inviting me into its polished interior. I pressed the button for my floor, the doors closed, and that's when normalcy ended and my descent into the unknown began. The elevator jolted suddenly a lurch that sent a spike of fear through me. Then, with a whir that grew increasingly frenetic, it descended. The digital display flickered, numbers and symbols flashing in a sequence that made no sense, a harbinger of the anomaly I was about to encounter. With a shuddering stop that knocked the breath from me, the elevator doors opened to reveal a sight that was starkly at odds with the hotel's opulent interior. A dimly lit, abandoned hallway stretched out before me, its walls peeling, the air thick with dust and a sense of desolation. This was not a floor I, or anyone else from the hotel, was meant to see. The air was heavy, charged with a palpable sense of dread that seemed to seep from the very walls. Faint whispers echoed in the distance, their words indiscernible but laden with urgency. I stood at the threshold, caught between the urge to explore and the instinct to flee. Choosing caution, I pressed the button to close the doors, but the elevator remained stubbornly still, its interior now feeling like a cage. Panic set in as I frantically pressed other floor buttons, each attempt met with the same unyielding silence from the elevator. It was then, in a moment of despair, that I stepped out into the hallway, my footsteps echoing ominously. The whispers grew louder, a cacophony of voices that seemed to emanate from nowhere and everywhere at once. The air felt colder here, the shadows deeper, as if the very light was reluctant to touch this place. After what felt like hours but could only have been minutes, the elevator sprang to life behind me, its interior light a beacon of hope in the oppressive gloom. I rushed back, the doors closing with a sound that was almost a sigh of relief. 
The ascent was smooth, a stark contrast to the descent that had taken me to that forgotten floor. When the doors opened again, I was greeted by the familiar, opulent lobby of the hotel, the normalcy of the scene in sharp contrast to the fear that still clawed at my insides. My inquiries to the hotel staff about the floor were met with polite confusion. No such floor existed, they insisted, their assurances doing little to quell the unease that had taken root in my heart. The elevator, they claimed, had been serviced recently, functioning perfectly with no record of malfunction. Yet the experience left an indelible mark, a memory that refused to be dismissed as mere imagination. The whispers, the sense of dread, the abandoned hallway all were as real to me as the hotel itself, a hidden depth to a place I thought I knew. In the days that followed, I found myself drawn to the elevator, a morbid fascination with the possibility of it happening again. But the elevator carried on as expected, its doors opening and closing to the known floors of the hotel, the anomaly of that night seemingly a singular event. The elevator that goes down too far became a story of my own, a personal encounter with the unknown that lingered in the back of my mind, a whisper among the normalcy of life. It was a reminder that beneath the surface of the familiar can lie depths untold, spaces forgotten by time and by man, existing just on the other side of reality. As the tale of the elevator that goes down too far unfolds, the haunting experience in the mysterious subterranean hallway lingered with me, an unshakable memory that colored my perception of the hotel and its seemingly benign surroundings. The staff's insistence on the non-existence of the floor only deepened the enigma, turning my stay into a quest for answers amidst a facade of normality. Compelled by a mixture of fear and intrigue, I embarked on a discreet investigation into the hotel's history, hoping to unearth any clues that might explain the eerie anomaly. My search led me to the local library, where dusty archives and forgotten records spoke of the hotel's past in hushed tones. Buried within these records, I discovered a chilling fact the hotel had been built atop the ruins of an older structure, one with a history marked by tragedy and unexplained occurrences. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to the hotel, my eyes now open to the subtle undercurrents of mystery that flowed beneath its polished surface. The whispers I had heard in the dimly lit hallway haunted my thoughts, their urgent tones suggesting a story desperate to be heard, a plea from the shadows. Determined to uncover the truth, I sought out the oldest member of the hotel staff, a reticent bellhop whose years of service had turned him into a living archive of the hotel's history. Over a cup of coffee, in a corner of the hotel where the past seemed to press close, he shared tales of the building's early days stories of guests who vanished without a trace, of unexplained sounds in the night, and of a pervasive sense of dread that settled over certain parts of the hotel. His words painted a picture of a place caught between worlds, its foundations rooted in a past that refused to be forgotten. The elevator's descent to a floor that didn't exist was not an isolated incident, but part of a pattern, a manifestation of the hotel's dark legacy. Fueled by the bellhop's stories, I decided to confront the elevator once again, this time with a sense of purpose. Armed with a digital recorder and a determination to document whatever I might find, I stepped into the elevator late one night, the hour when the barrier between the known and the unknown seemed thinnest. The descent began as it had before, the elevator carrying me down, down, past the familiar floors, past the boundaries of the known hotel, and into the depths of its hidden history. The doors opened once again to the dimly lit hallway, the air thick with anticipation. This time, I stepped out with a resolve to explore to uncover the secrets that lay in the shadows. The whispers grew louder, guiding me down the hall to a door that stood ajar, light flickering from within. Inside, I found a room that bore the marks of occupancy a desk with scattered papers, a chair overturned as if in haste, and a wall covered in frantic writings that spoke of a reality fractured, of a presence that haunted the hotel's hidden floor. The recordings I made that night captured more than just the ambient sounds of an abandoned space they contained voices, whispers that coalesced into coherent pleas, sharing tales of loss and entrapment of souls caught in the liminal space the hotel had become. Emerging from the elevator back into the familiar lobby, I knew the hotel was more than just a place of rest and respite it was a nexus of stories, a place where the past and present intertwined in ways I could never have imagined. 
The experience left me with more questions than answers, but one thing was certain the elevator that went down too far had opened a door to understanding the hotel's true nature, a layer hidden beneath the surface, filled with tales of sorrow, mystery, and the unyielding grip of the past. Story 14 The hotel's allure was rooted in its history and mystery, drawing me in with tales of guests from another era and whispers of unexplained occurrences. My room, quaint and comfortable, held the charm of bygone days, its windows offering views of the ancient city that sprawled below. It was the perfect setting for a tale yet untold, a chapter in my life that I hoped would be filled with adventure and perhaps a touch of the unknown. The first night passed peacefully, the city's distant sounds a lullaby that lulled me into a deep sleep. However, on the second night, tranquility was replaced by a chilling encounter. I awoke suddenly, a sense of unease permeating the dark room. The air felt charged, heavy with anticipation. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I noticed a figure seated at the edge of my bed, a shadow against the moonlit room. The figure was speaking in hushed tones, a language I couldn't understand but felt eerily familiar, as if it was a forgotten dream being whispered into reality. I blinked, and in that brief moment of darkness, the figure vanished, leaving no trace of its presence save for the lingering feeling of being watched. Panic and fascination warred within me. Had I dreamed the encounter, or had the veil between the past and the present thinned enough to allow such a visitation? My rational mind searched for explanations, but the vividness of the experience defied dismissal as mere imagination. The next day, driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, I approached the hotel staff with questions hoping to shed light on the night's events. Their initial confusion turned to concern as I described the figure, their demeanor shifting, as if a long-forgotten memory had been stirred. With hesitance, the oldest among them shared a tale that sent shivers down my spine. Years ago, a guest matching the description of my nocturnal visitor had stayed in my very room. Known for their solitude and peculiar habits, they had become a subject of whispered speculation among the staff and guests alike. Then, one day, the guest vanished without a trace, their belongings left untouched, their fate a mystery that had since been buried in the annals of the hotel's history. The revelation that I might have been visited by the specter of a guest lost to time was both terrifying and compelling. The hotel, with its layers of history, had always promised more than just a stay it offered a connection to the past, a bridge to stories untold. Each night thereafter, I found myself caught between the desire for sleep and the fear of another visitation. I would wake to every sound, every shift in the darkness, half expecting to see the shadowy figure once again. But the nights passed without incident, the figure never reappearing its message, if there was one, remaining undelivered. The rest of my stay was marked by an undercurrent of unease, the feeling of being part of a story that I could neither see nor fully comprehend. The hotel with its silent corridors and whispering walls, held secrets that I could only graze the surface of, a reminder of the thin veil between the known and the unknown. Upon my departure, the hotel staff wished me well, their eyes holding a mixture of relief and sorrow. It was as if my encounter had reopened a chapter they hoped had been closed, a reminder of the mysteries that lingered in the shadows of the hotel. The uninvited roommate had become more than just a personal experience, it was a thread in the larger tapestry of the hotel's history, a connection to the past that refused to be forgotten. It was a story that I would carry with me, a haunting reminder of the unseen forces that weave through our lives, touching us in ways we may never fully understand. The encounter left me with a profound sense of curiosity that outweighed my fear. The mystery of the vanished guest, now possibly my uninvited roommate, was a puzzle I felt compelled to solve. My days were spent combing through local archives and newspapers, seeking any clue that might shed light on the identity of the shadowy figure and the circumstances surrounding their disappearance. The deeper I delved into the history of the hotel and its many guests, the more I became aware of a pattern of strange occurrences. Stories of unexplained sounds, fleeting shadows, and feelings of being watched were common, threading through the years like a dark undercurrent. Yet, the story of my visitor remained elusive, a gap in the hotel's tapestry of tales. Determined to find answers, I sought out the expertise of a local historian known for her knowledge of the city's forgotten narratives. She listened intently to my account, 
her eyes reflecting a mix of fascination and caution. The hotel you're staying in, she began, has long been a focal point for unexplained phenomena. It's as if the building itself is a repository for the energy of all who've passed through its doors, especially those who left something unresolved. She suggested that the figure might be a manifestation of this unresolved energy, a spirit bound to the hotel due to unfinished business, or a deep emotional attachment to the place. Your encounter, she proposed, might have been an attempt at communication, a way for the spirit to reach out and be acknowledged. Armed with this new perspective, I returned to the hotel with a plan. That night I sat awake in the dimly lit room, a digital recorder by my side in the hope of capturing any attempt at communication. The hours ticked by, the silence a heavy cloak that seemed almost palpable. Then, just as exhaustion began to take hold, the temperature in the room dropped, a sure sign that something or someone was with me. I spoke into the darkness, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. I know you're here, I said. I want to understand your story, to help if I can. The air stirred, a whisper of movement that sent chills down my spine. The digital recorder captured a faint voice, a hushed tone that mirrored my nocturnal visitors. Help me, it pleaded, the words barely audible, a cry from the beyond that bridged the gap between worlds. The next days were spent in a fervent search for any missing persons or unresolved cases that might correspond with the spirit's plea. It was a painstaking process, one that required the piecing together of fragmented records and testimonies. Ultimately, it was a decades-old missing person report that provided the breakthrough. The report detailed the disappearance of a guest who had checked into the hotel but never checked out, their fate a mystery that had baffled investigators. Armed with this information, I approached the hotel management, urging them to acknowledge the tragedy and to consider a memorial for the lost guest, a way to honor their memory and perhaps provide the peace needed for their spirit to move on. The management was resistant at first, wary of drawing attention to a dark chapter in the hotel's history. But the evidence was compelling, and the plea captured on the digital recorder was undeniable. Eventually, they agreed, and a small plaque was placed in the lobby, a silent testament to the guest who had vanished but was no longer forgotten. In the weeks that followed, the atmosphere in. The room and perhaps the hotel itself felt lighter as if acknowledging the presence and story of the uninvited roommate had lifted a weight from the building's soul. The whispers and the sense of being watched faded, replaced by a peaceful silence that spoke of resolution and rest. My encounter with the shadowy figure at the edge of my bed had transformed from a moment of terror to a journey of discovery and closure. It was a poignant reminder of the thin veil between the seen and the unseen, and of the stories that linger in the spaces we inhabit waiting for someone to listen, to understand, and to remember. As I prepared to leave the hotel, I felt a sense of completion, as though my stay had served a purpose beyond my initial expectations. The plaque in the lobby caught my eye one last time, a simple tribute to a soul that had once been lost but was now acknowledged, their story woven into the fabric of the hotel's history. The uninvited roommate was no longer just my story but a shared narrative of connection across time and realms, a testament to the power of memory and the importance of giving voice to those who had been silenced. It was a chapter one would carry with me, a reminder of the unseen threads that connect us all, in life and beyond. Story 15 The hotel, with its storied past and architectural grandeur, had always been a place of fascination for me. Its hallowed halls and whispered history spoke of a time long past inviting those with a penchant for the mysterious to explore its depths. It was during one such exploration, a search for the hidden stories etched into its very bones, that I discovered the diary. A loose floorboard in my room, unnoticed by those who had tread this space before me, yielded a secret kept silent for decades. Beneath it lay an old diary, its leather cover worn and pages yellowed with age. The discovery sent a thrill through me, a connection to the past made tangible through this unexpected find. As I turned the pages, a story unfolded, not of dates and events, but of a mind grappling with an unfathomable reality. The entries, penned in a frantic hand, detailed the experiences of a previous guest, one who believed the hotel was not just a structure of wood and stone, 
but a living entity capable of thought and communication. The guest wrote of whispers in the night, not from the lips of the living, but emanating from the very walls of the hotel. These whispers, he claimed, spoke directly to him, offering cryptic messages that hinted at a deeper, more sinister consciousness at work. With each entry, his fear and obsession grew, the hotel transforming in his eyes from a place of refuge to a malevolent being intent on ensnaring his mind. His entries were filled with despairing thoughts, a descent into madness that was as compelling as it was tragic. The hotel, in his mind, had become a predator, and he its unwilling prey. The entries grew more erratic, the handwriting more desperate, as he sought to understand the purpose behind the hotel's communication, and ultimately his own fate within its walls. The final entry ended abruptly, a sentence cut off mid-thought, leaving only questions in its wake. What had become of the guest? Had the hotel, as he believed, consumed him, not in body but in spirit? Or had he found a way to escape the grasp of its unseen influence? Compelled by a mix of horror and intrigue, I began my own investigation into the hotel's past, seeking to uncover the truth behind the diary's author and his fate. The staff, when questioned, offered polite denials of any knowledge of such a guest, their eyes darting away as if avoiding a truth too dangerous to acknowledge. Undeterred, I delved deeper, my search uncovering a history of unexplained disappearances and tales of guests who claimed the hotel spoke to them in the dead of night. These stories, whispered in hushed tones and quickly dismissed, painted a picture of a place where the boundary between the living and the ethereal was perilously thin. The diary, then, was not just the ramblings of a disturbed mind but a testament to the hotel's hidden nature, a record of its silent communication with those sensitive enough to hear its voice. The realization that I, too, might be subject to its whispers filled me with an unease that shadowed my every step within its walls. Nights became a time of vigilance, the silence of my room heavy with anticipation. Would the hotel speak to me as it had to the diary's author? And if so, what would it say? My thoughts churned with possibilities, the diary's presence a constant reminder of the thin veil separating me from a fate unknown. As days bled into nights, I documented my experiences, my own entries mirroring the desperation of the diary's author. The hotel remained a silent observer, its whispers, if they existed, eluding my eager ears. Yet the sense of being watched, of being judged by an unseen force, grew stronger with each passing day. The diary under the floorboards had become both a curse and a compulsion, drawing me deeper into the heart of the hotel's mystery. What began as a quest for understanding had morphed into a struggle for sanity, the line between reality and madness blurred by the very walls that surrounded me. The diary's last abrupt entry became an obsession, a cliffhanger that demanded resolution. I couldn't shake the feeling that the key to understanding the hotel's mysterious communications and perhaps the fate of its author lay hidden within its cryptic messages. The hotel, for its part, maintained its stoic silence, a monolith indifferent to my quest for answers. Determined to peel back the layers of mystery, I spent my days roaming the hotel's endless corridors and hidden spaces, seeking any clue that might shed light on the diary's origins and its author's identity. The more I explored, the more the hotel seemed to reveal itself as a labyrinth, a maze designed to both entrap and enlighten. One evening, as twilight cast long shadows across the ornate lobby, I encountered an elderly staff member, her presence as much a part of the hotel as the antique furnishings that adorned it. Her eyes, when I mentioned the diary, held a glimmer of recognition, a spark quickly smothered by caution. In every wall, a story in every room, a soul, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the hum of distant conversations. The hotel sees all, knows all, but shares its secrets on its terms, not ours. Her cryptic response only fueled my determination. That night, as I sat alone in my room, the diary opened before me. I decided to confront the hotel directly, to challenge it to reveal its secrets. I know you're more than just stone and mortar, I spoke into the silence, my voice steady. I've read the diary, I've heard the tales. Show me, speak to me. The air in the room shifted, a palpable change in atmosphere that sent a shiver down my spine. The walls, once mere barriers between spaces, 
now felt like the membrane of a living entity, pulsating with unseen energy. And then, the whispers began. Soft at first, they grew in intensity, a chorus of voices that filled the room, their words overlapping, indecipherable. The sensation of being surrounded by a multitude of unseen presences was overwhelming, a flood of emotions and thoughts that were not my own. Amidst the cacophony, a single voice emerged, clear and resonant, its message delivered with an urgency that left no room for doubt. Seek the heart it urged. Only there will you find what you seek. The voices faded as suddenly as they had appeared, leaving behind a silence that echoed with the weight of revealed truths. The diary's author had spoken of the hotel communicating with him, and now I had experienced it firsthand. The following days were a blur of activity, each clue unraveling another thread of the mystery. The heart of the hotel became my singular focus, leading me to the oldest part of the building, a section long closed off and forgotten. It was there, in a room shrouded in dust and shadows, that I found the culmination of my search. The heart of the hotel, a grand, ancient fireplace long cold, held the remnants of what once was a collection of personal items, photographs, and letters that told the stories of those who had passed through its doors. Among the detritus, I found a photograph of the diary's author, his features mirroring the despair that had filled his pages. His belongings, scattered as if in haste, painted a picture of a man desperate to be heard, to be understood. In that moment, the hotel's true nature was revealed to me not as a malevolent entity, but as a keeper of stories, a guardian of the myriad lives that had intertwined within its walls. The diary and the whispers were expressions of a deeper connection, a desire to communicate the pain, joy, and complexity of the human experience. The resolution of the mystery brought a sense of closure, not only for me but for the diary's author. His story, once confined to the hidden pages of a forgotten diary, was now acknowledged, a whisper among the many that echoed in the hotel's halls. As I left the hotel, the diary tucked safely away, I couldn't help but feel a profound sense of awe for the enigmatic building and its unseen inhabitants. The diary under the floorboards was more than just a tale of a hidden past, it was a reminder of our need to connect, to be seen and understood, across the boundaries of time and existence. Story 16 The hotel had always boasted of its timeless elegance and an air of mystery, but what drew me to it was the promise of quiet a sanctuary from the clamor of the outside world. My room, a cozy enclave on the upper floors, offered the solitude I sought, or so I thought until the whispers began. It started on the first night, a soft murmuring from the air vent that could easily be mistaken for the building settling into the silence of the night. But as the hours waned, the whispers grew more distinct, weaving through the darkness with a clarity that sent shivers down my spine. There were voices, laden with emotion, recounting tales of sorrow, love, and regret. Night after night, the vent became a conduit for these spectral conversations, a gallery of unseen guests reliving their moments of vulnerability. I listened, fascinated and horrified in equal measure, as each story unfolded, a mosaic of human experience painted in words of longing and loss. The realization that these were the voices of past guests, their most intimate confessions carried through the bowels of the hotel, was unsettling. Yet, it was the chilling moment of recognition that shattered my detachment, a voice that mirrored my own, recounting a tale of regret from just the night before. Panic took root in my heart. Had I spoken aloud in my sleep, my own tales of sorrow added to the hotel's collection? Or was the hotel itself drawing out my deepest regrets, giving voice to thoughts I dared not acknowledge even to myself? The questions haunted me by day, the whispers by night, each echoing the other in a relentless cycle that left me frayed and desperate for answers. I turned to the hotel staff, inquiring about the vent and its mysterious transmissions, but was met with polite bafflement and reassurances that no other guest had reported such experiences. Undeterred, I delved into the history of the hotel, searching for any clue that might explain the phenomenon. The archives revealed a past punctuated by tragedy and triumph a reflection of the myriad lives that had passed through its doors. Yet there was nothing to suggest why the hotel would harbor the voices of its guests, much less recreate them with such fidelity. 
The breakthrough came unexpectedly from an elderly maintenance worker who had been with the hotel for decades. The vents, he said, his voice a whisper itself, are part of the original structure, a network that connects every room. They say the founder believed in the power of stories, that sharing them could heal the soul. He designed the hotel to capture those stories, to keep them alive within its walls. The revelation was as astonishing as it was terrifying. The hotel, a living archive of human emotion, had ensnared my own voice in its collection, blurring the lines between listener and contributor, observer and participant. With newfound resolve, I returned to my room, facing the vent that had become both confessor and captor. As night descended, I spoke into the darkness, not with words of regret but of understanding and forgiveness, a message to the past guests and to myself. The whispers that night were different, a chorus of voices that seemed to rise in acknowledgement, their tales of sorrow mingling with ones of hope and redemption. And amid the chorus, my own voice returned, not in regret but in a narrative of acceptance and peace. The nights that followed were quieter, the whispers less frequent, as if the hotel had found closure in the sharing of its collected stories. My own nights were calmer, the recognition of my voice within the vent no longer a source of fear but a reminder of the power of our shared humanity, the strength found in vulnerability. The whispering vent had become more than just a peculiar feature of an old hotel, it was a testament to the enduring nature of our stories, the echoes of our lives that linger in the spaces we inhabit, connecting us in ways we can scarcely imagine. As I checked out of the hotel, the weight of the experience settled within me, a mix of relief and melancholy. The hotel, with its whispers and secrets, had changed me, teaching me the importance of listening, not just to the voices in the vents but to the stories of those around us, and to the quiet confessions of our own hearts. In the end, the whispers were a gift, a haunting melody of life's complexity and beauty, a reminder that we are all part of a larger narrative. Our voices intertwined in the fabric of a world that listens, remembers, and whispers back. Story 17 But The glow of the moonlight barely filtered through the dense fog that enveloped the small, remote motel I had checked into for the night. Exhaustion weighed heavily on my shoulders after a long day's drive, a desperate escape from the city's clamor to find solace and isolation. The motel, a relic from a bygone era, seemed to whisper stories through its crumbling facade and the eerie silence that hung heavily in the air. The room was modest, with a touch of melancholy in its outdated decor. A single bed, a worn-out armchair, and a dusty dresser were its only furnishings. An old painting of a serene lake, the colors faded with time, adorned the wall above the bed, its tranquility in stark contrast to the unsettling feeling that crept into my bones. I had checked in alone, a fact the motel owner, an elderly man with a weary smile, confirmed with a nod before handing me the key. That night, sleep was a reluctant visitor. Tossing and turning, I struggled against the tendrils of unease that wrapped around me. The silence of the motel was oppressive, punctuated only by the distant howl of the wind. When sleep finally claimed me, it was deep and dreamless. The morning light brought no relief from the unease of the night. As I sat up, groggy and disoriented, my eyes caught a glimpse of something out of place. A photograph lay on the nightstand, its edges curling slightly. With a trembling hand, I reached for it, my heart pounding against my ribcage. It was a photo of me sleeping. The angle suggested it was taken from a corner of the room, a silent observer in the dark. The timestamp confirmed my worst fears it was from the night before. Panic surged through me, a cold and unrelenting tide. The room had been locked from the inside, the windows sealed shut. The impossibility of the situation twisted my stomach into knots. My mind raced as I tried to piece together the events of the night. I had checked in alone, the room locked securely behind me. No signs of forced entry, no hidden cameras in sight, yet someone or something had been in the room with me, watching, waiting. The photograph was a chilling testament to the unseen presence that had violated my sanctuary. Questions spiraled through my thoughts with no answers in sight. Was I being watched? Followed? The isolation I had sought now seemed like a naive folly, a trap that had snared me in its depths. 
driven by a mix of fear and determination, I began a meticulous search of the room. Every nook and cranny, every shadowy corner was scrutinized, but I found nothing. No evidence of intrusion, no clues to the identity of my unseen observer. The realization that I was alone with an unseen menace sent shivers down my spine. I decided to confront the motel owner, a desperate attempt to find some explanation, any rationalization for the photograph. The elderly man listened with a somber expression, his eyes reflecting a sorrow I couldn't understand. When I showed him the photo, a heavy sigh escaped his lips, a sound that seemed to carry the weight of untold stories. Many guests have stayed in that room, he began, his voice barely above a whisper. And some, they leave with more than they came with. You're not the first to find such a photograph, his words hung in the air, a chilling revelation that this wasn't an isolated incident. The motel, it seemed, held secrets far darker than its dilapidated exterior suggested. The story he told was one of tragedy and loss. Many years ago, a young woman had stayed in the room, a runaway seeking refuge from her own demons. Her stay was meant to be a respite, a moment of peace in a tumultuous life. But peace was a fleeting dream within the walls of that room. She was found one morning, lifeless, with no explanation for her untimely demise. Since then, guests have reported strange occurrences, unsettling feelings, and photographs left behind, a haunting reminder of the room's sorrowful past. Emboldened by the motel owner's revelations, a mix of fear and intrigue propelled me to delve deeper into the mystery. The photo, a silent harbinger of the unseen, became my grim compass. The daylight hours passed in a blur of local archives and whispered conversations with the few locals willing to speak of the motel's troubled past. Each story, each snippet of history, wove a tapestry of sorrow and unexplained phenomena that clung to the place like a pervasive fog. As night approached, a resolve settled over me. I would spend another night in the room, a decision that seemed to tread the fine line between bravery and madness. Armed with a camera and a voice recorder, I sought to capture any evidence of the presence that haunted the room, to confront the unseen observer who had invaded my solitude. The night was a symphony of silence and waiting. Every creak and whisper of wind sent my heart racing, every shadow seemed to shift with sinister intent. Hours ticked by, a torturous measure of time that stretched and warped in the suffocating atmosphere of the room. Then, it happened. A chill swept through the room, a palpable shift in the air that heralded the arrival of the unseen. The camera, positioned to capture the room, clicked and whirred as it recorded. The voice recorder, placed on the nightstand beside the bed, captured the sound of my own breathing, heightened by fear, and beneath it, a whisper. Soft, almost inaudible, a voice that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. I'm sorry it breathed, a sorrowful lament that froze my blood. The words spoken with such despair pierced the veil of fear that had enveloped me. This presence, this unseen observer, was not a malevolent force, but a soul trapped in endless sorrow, reliving its tragedy night after night. The realization sparked a compassion within me, a desire to help release this tortured spirit from its earthly bindings. With a voice that trembled with emotion, I spoke into the darkness, acknowledging the presence, offering words of comfort and release. I know you're here, I said softly. I don't know why you're trapped, but you don't have to stay. You can leave, find peace. The air stirred, a gentle caress that felt like an acknowledgement, a sign of understanding. The oppressive feeling that had dominated the room lifted, replaced by a serene calm that seemed to blanket the space. In the days that followed, the photograph remained a tangible reminder of the encounter, a bridge between worlds seen and unseen. The motel owner, upon hearing my experience, nodded with a knowing smile, a glint of relief in his eyes. The room, he said, had been quiet since that night, the chain of unexplained phenomena seemingly broken. As I left the motel, the photo in hand, a sense of closure accompanied me. The journey that had begun with fear and isolation had led to an unexpected connection, a reminder that sometimes, the things we fear are simply misunderstood. The world is full of mysteries, of stories waiting to be told. My encounter at the motel, 
The photo that shouldn't exist was a testament to the unseen layers of reality that surround us, a personal exploration of fear, compassion, and the human desire to understand the unknown. Story 18 As the motel owner's tale unfurled, a chilling sense of dread wrapped itself around me, tighter with every word. The story of the young woman, her life cut tragically short within the very walls that had promised shelter, echoed my fears and magnified them. The photograph, a silent harbinger of unseen forces at play, became a symbol of my entanglement in the motel's dark history. I had to leave to escape the oppressive weight of the secrets that clung to the peeling wallpaper and creaking floorboards. Yet, a part of me yearned for answers, for understanding. The photograph was a puzzle, a key to unraveling the mystery that shrouded the motel and its spectral inhabitants. My days became consumed with research, delving into the history of the motel and the land it stood on. The library in the nearest town held archives of local newspapers, their pages yellowed with age. There, amidst the tales of mundane life and local events, I found hints of the motel's dark past. Articles spoke of disappearances, of travelers who sought refuge within its rooms and were never seen again. Whispers of a curse, a malevolent force that fed on the sorrows of its guests, weaving their despair into the very fabric of the building. Nights were spent in restless vigil, the photograph my constant companion. The room felt alive, charged with an energy that prickled my skin. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, and the air grew thick with anticipation. The boundary between the seen and unseen blurred, as if the photograph had opened a door to a realm that defied explanation. It was on the seventh night that the room revealed its true nature. As the clock struck midnight, the air shimmered, and the room dot 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 changed. The walls faded away, replaced by an endless expanse of darkness. Within that void, I saw her the young woman from the motel owner's story. She was not alone. Figures moved in the shadows, their faces obscured, their presence a palpable force that filled the room with sorrow. The young woman approached, her eyes reflecting a depth of sadness that no words could capture. She reached out, her hand cold and insubstantial, yet heavy with meaning. Help us, she whispered, her voice a mere breath, yet it resonated with a power that shook me to my core. I realized then that the photograph was not a warning, but a plea. A bridge between the living and the dead, a call to action for someone, anyone, to break the cycle of suffering that the motel harbored. The days that followed were a blur of activity. I enlisted the help of local historians, psychics, and anyone who had experienced the motel's eerie influence. Together we unraveled the threads of the curse, tracing its origins to a tragedy that predated the motel itself. The land was tainted, soaked in the blood of an unjust death, its agony manifesting through the centuries. Our efforts culminated in a night of rituals and reckonings. We stood in the room, encircled by the spirits of those trapped within the motel's grasp. Words of release and peace were spoken, offerings made to soothe the anguished land. The air vibrated with energy, a storm of emotion and power that threatened to overwhelm us. And then, silence. A peace so profound it felt as though the world had exhaled, releasing the pain and sorrow that had festered for so long. The spirits, including the young woman, faded into the light, their departure marked by a sense of completion, of journeys concluded and rest finally found. The photograph remained, a reminder of the ordeal and the role I played in ending the motel's curse. I left the next day, the weight of the experience a constant shadow at the edge of my consciousness. The motel, now a place of peace, stood as a testament to the power of belief, of the ability to change the narrative of a place marked by tragedy. As I drove away, the sun broke through the clouds, casting the motel in a new light. It was as if the building itself had been transformed, shedding the cloak of despair that had clung to its walls. The future was uncertain, but one thing was clear the photograph, once a symbol of fear, had become a beacon of hope, a reminder that even in the darkest of places, light could be found and peace restored. The journey had changed me, had shown me the thin veil that separates the seen from the unseen, the living from the dead. The photograph, now tucked safely in my journal, serves as a reminder of the mystery and wonder that lies just beyond the edge of our understanding, waiting to be discovered. Story 19 Our 
armed with the knowledge of the room's grim history, a cold resolve settled over me. The photograph, a silent witness to my night of unseen observation, now felt like a piece of a larger, more sinister puzzle. The motel owner's tale, while shedding light on the room's past, offered no solace, only a deepening of the mystery that ensnared me. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to spend another night in the room. The decision felt like a dance with danger, a step into the unknown driven by an insatiable need for answers. As nightfall draped its velvet cloak over the world, the room once again became a stage for the unseen play of shadows and fears. This time I was prepared. A digital camera, set to capture images throughout the night, was my silent sentinel. I lay in bed, the covers pulled tight, my eyes wide open in the darkness. The hours ticked by, each minute stretching into an eternity of anticipation and dread. The air grew heavy, a tangible pressure that seemed to weigh down on me, thick with the residue of untold stories. The silence of the room was broken only by my own shallow breaths, a soundtrack to the waiting game I played with the unseen. Sleep, once a reluctant visitor, now seemed an impossible dream. As dawn broke, a cautious hope fluttered within me. The night had passed without incident, or so it seemed. My first act was to check the camera, my heart racing with anticipation and fear. The images it captured told a story of their own, a chronological journey through the night. Most showed nothing but the dimly lit room, empty and still. But then, there was a figure, barely visible, captured in the corner of the room. Its form was blurred, indistinct, as if made of shadows and mist. There was no mistaking the intent, though. It was watching, always watching. The revelation was a shock, a visceral blow that left me reeling. The unseen presence now caught in the act was no longer a mere specter of imagination. It was real, as real as the fear that coursed through me. But with the fear came a surge of determination, a need to confront this entity, to reclaim my peace. Armed with the evidence, I sought out the motel owner once again. His reaction to the photographs was a complex tapestry of fear, resignation, and sorrow. He admitted to knowing of the entity, a restless spirit bound to the room, a remnant of a tragic past that refused to fade into oblivion. The motel, it seemed, was a beacon for the lost, a place where the veil between worlds was thin enough for such occurrences to bleed through. He offered no solutions, only sympathy and a warning to leave before nightfall. But I couldn't leave. Not yet. The photograph, the entity, the room they had become a part of my story. A chapter one couldn't close without understanding. My next step was clear. I needed to reach out, to communicate with the spirit, to understand its message, its reason for haunting not just the room, but my very existence. The day passed in a blur of preparations. I sought out tools of the trade, items known to aid in communication with the spirit world a digital voice recorder, a spirit box, and an old-fashioned Ouija board were my arsenal against the unknown. As night embraced the world once again, I set up my equipment in the room. The air felt charged, electric with anticipation. I started with the voice recorder, asking questions into the ether, hoping for a response from beyond the veil. Who are you? Why do you watch? What do you want from me? My voice, steady at first, trembled with the gravity of the situation. The room remained silent, the recorder capturing nothing but the sound of my own heartbeat. Next I tried the spirit box, a device known to scan radio frequencies at high speed, allowing spirits to communicate through the white noise. But again there was silence, a frustrating absence of answers. Finally I turned to the Ouija board, a tool I approached with a mix of skepticism and fear. As I placed my fingers lightly on the planchette, I felt a cold gust of air sweep through the room. A sign, perhaps, of the presence I sought. The planchette moved slowly at first, then with purpose, spelling out a message that chilled me to the bone. W-A-T-C-H-I-N-G, the word was a confirmation, a declaration from the entity itself. It was watching, always watching, but the why remained a mystery. As the night progressed, the atmosphere in the room grew oppressive, the air thick with the presence of something unseen. The photographs, the evidence, the attempts at communication, they all led me to this moment, a standstill in a battle of wills with an entity that refused to be understood. The sun's first rays brought an end to the longest night of my life, 
Exhausted but resolute, I packed my belongings, the photograph of my sleeping form among them. The motel, the room, the entity I left them behind, but the questions, the fear, they followed me, a haunting melody that refused to fade. Story 20 As a travel writer, the allure of unseen corners of the world always fascinated me, drawing me to places veiled in mystery and untouched by the clamor of modern life. My latest assignment led me to a secluded inn nestled in the heart of an ancient forest, a place rumored to hold secrets as old as the whispering trees that surrounded it. The inn known as the Sylvan Retreat, promised solitude and a connection with nature, a retreat from the digital chains that bound us to the incessant buzz of the outside world. Upon arrival, the innkeeper, a woman whose age was as indiscernible as the history of the inn itself, welcomed me with a warm yet distant smile. She handed me the key to my room, number seven, located on the top floor of the ancient structure. You'll find the view from your room quite unique, she said, her voice laced with an unplaceable emotion. The room was quaint with rustic furniture that seemed to have been crafted from the very forest that embraced the inn, but it was the window that caught my immediate attention. It offered a breathtaking view of a serene courtyard, a picturesque scene of cobblestone pathways, lush greenery, and a small fountain at its center. It was a view to be cherished, a peaceful vista that calmed the weary spirit. As night fell, the courtyard took on an ethereal beauty. Moonlight danced on the fountain's waters and shadows played among the trees, creating a tranquil scene that felt almost otherworldly. People moved about the courtyard, their movements silent and graceful, like specters of a bygone era. They did not speak, nor did they acknowledge my presence at the window, lost in routines and rituals unknown to me. Intrigued by this nightly spectacle, I decided to visit the courtyard the following day, eager to feel the cobblestones beneath my feet and hear the fountain's gentle murmur. However, daylight revealed a startling truth the courtyard didn't exist. In its place stood a towering brick wall, cold and unyielding, with no sign of the verdant oasis I had witnessed under the moon's gentle gaze. Confusion took root in my mind, a seed of doubt that grew with each passing day. Every night the courtyard reappeared, a silent stage for the spectral figures that roamed its paths, and every morning the brick wall stood firm, a silent guardian of secrets that the daylight could not penetrate. Determined to uncover the truth, I approached the innkeeper, questioning the existence of the courtyard and its nightly apparitions. Her reaction was one of resignation, as if she had anticipated my inquiries from the moment I arrived. The courtyard exists in a time not our own, she began, her voice a whisper. It is a glimpse into the past, a window to a moment frozen in eternity. The figures you see are echoes of lives once lived, bound to the courtyard by ties we cannot comprehend. Her words were a puzzle, pieces of a larger mystery that enveloped the inn and its surroundings. The courtyard, it seemed, was a bridge between worlds, a link to a past that refused to be forgotten. The spectral figures were not ghosts in the traditional sense, but remnants of energy, imprints left on the fabric of time. Driven by a need to understand, I spent my nights at the window, watching the courtyard and its silent inhabitants. I took notes, sketched the scenes before me, and tried to capture the essence of the place that existed between the ticks of the clock. My obsession with the courtyard and its ethereal occupants deepened with each passing night. The figures, though silent and seemingly unaware of my presence, began to reveal the intricacies of their existence. A woman in a dress that whispered of a bygone era would often sit by the fountain, her hands trailing in the water, lost in thought. A pair of children played near the edge of the courtyard, their laughter silent but visible in their joyful expressions and movements. Despite the barrier of time that separated us, I felt a connection to these shadows of the past. They were, in their own way, as real as I was, caught in the loop of their own histories, repeating the same motions, the same moments, night after night. The realization that I was a mere observer to their world, unable to interact or alter their fates, filled me with a sense of melancholy. Their existence, trapped in the courtyard's timeless embrace, seemed both beautiful and infinitely sad. Curiosity led me to the local archives, where I delved into the history of the inn and its surroundings. The records were sparse, but I managed to uncover tales of the inn's past, 
stories of love, loss, and the passage of time. The courtyard, it appeared, had been the heart of the community, a gathering place for celebrations and daily life until a devastating fire claimed it many years ago. Armed with this knowledge, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. The courtyard I saw each night was a memory, a slice of time preserved against the ravages of fire and decay. The figures were not bound by spectral chains but by the strength of their emotions and experiences, imprinted so deeply on the place that not even fire could erase them. As my stay at the inn drew to a close, I knew that my time as a witness to the courtyard's nightly resurrection was ending. The thought filled me with an unexpected sorrow, a sense of loss for a place I could never truly inhabit and for people I could never meet. On my last night I stood at the window, taking in the scene one final time. The courtyard, with its spectral inhabitants, seemed more alive than ever, a vivid tapestry of life and memory that defied the passage of time. In the morning I packed my belongings, the sketches and notes of the courtyard among them. As I prepared to leave, the innkeeper met me at the door. Her eyes held a depth of understanding, a shared knowledge of the courtyard's secret. The courtyard will remain, long after we are gone, she said. It is a testament to the power of memory, to the indelible mark that moments of joy and sorrow leave on the world. With a final glance at the brick wall that stood where the courtyard danced in the moonlight, I left the inn. The experience, like the courtyard itself, had become a part of me, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the past from the present, memory from reality. Story 21 As the days melded into nights, my obsession with the courtyard and its ghostly occupants deepened. The innkeeper's tale of a world suspended in time of lives echoing through the ages had taken root in my soul, entwining with my own existence. Each figure in the courtyard began to feel familiar, their silent routines a language I yearned to decipher. I found myself researching the history of the land upon which the inn stood, delving into old archives and local legends. The inn, it appeared, had been built upon the ruins of an ancient estate, one with a history steeped in both grandeur and tragedy. A devastating fire had claimed the original structure, along with the family that resided within, their fates forever sealed in the ashes. This discovery cast a new light on the nightly apparitions. Were they the remnants of the family, bound to the land they once called home? Or were they something else, spirits of a different ilk, drawn to the inn by its unique position at the crossroads of time and space? My questions multiplied, each answer birthing new mysteries. The innkeeper watched my descent into obsession with a knowing eye, her initial warnings fading into silence. It was clear she had seen this before, travelers caught in the web of the courtyard's enigma. Determined to bridge the gap between past and present, I decided to attempt communication with the spectral figures. Armed with a rudimentary knowledge of Morse code and a flashlight, I sent a simple message into the night who are you. The courtyard, bathed in moonlight, remained as silent and serene as ever. The figures continued their ghostly wanderings, oblivious or indifferent to my plea. Yet, as I was about to abandon my efforts, a single figure paused, turning towards the window. In that moment, time itself seemed to hold its breath. The figure, a woman dressed in the faded elegance of a bygone era, raised her hand. Her movements were slow, deliberate, as she tapped out a response, bound. The word echoed in the silence of my room, a single term laden with a myriad of questions. Bound by what? To whom? The implications were as chilling as they were fascinating. In the days that followed, I attempted further communication. Each attempt met with varying degrees of success. The figures, it seemed, were trapped in a loop, their awareness of the present moment fleeting and inconsistent. Yet, in those brief intersections of time, they shared glimpses of their existence, tales of joy and sorrow, love and loss. The courtyard, I realized, was not just a window to the past, it was a mirror reflecting the universal truths of the human condition, a reminder that some bonds transcend the boundaries of time. The spectral figures were not mere echoes, they were the very essence of the lives they once led, preserved in the amber of eternity. As my time at the inn drew to a close, the reality of my departure weighed heavily on me. The courtyard and its inhabitants had become a part of me, 
a chapter in my own story that I was reluctant to end. On my last night, I stood at the window watching the courtyard with a bittersweet ache in my heart. As if sensing my farewell, the courtyard came alive with a vibrancy I had never seen before. The figures moved with a purpose, their routines giving way to celebration. And there, in the center of it all, stood the woman who had first responded to my call. She looked up at me, a smile crossing her spectral face, a silent acknowledgement of the connection we had forged across the divide. The next morning, the brick wall greeted me with its cold indifference, the courtyard hidden once again in the light of day. But the memories of what I had witnessed, of the connections I had made, remained vibrant and alive within me. I left the inn with a heavy heart, my soul forever marked by the experience. The Sylvan Retreat, with its mysterious courtyard, had revealed to me the timeless nature of existence, the endless cycle of life and death, and the indelible mark we leave on the world and each other. Story 22 The innkeeper's revelations deepened the enigma of the courtyard, casting a shadow of mystery over my stay. The boundary between past and present blurred each night as I watched the courtyard come alive, a silent film played for an audience of one. The spectral figures, bound to their eternal routine, became familiar to me, their faces etched in memory like characters from a story untold. Curiosity turned into obsession as I delved deeper into the history of the inn and the land it stood upon. The local library held records dating back centuries, tales of the forest and the people who once called it home. Among these records I found mention of a grand estate, its gardens the jewel of the region, celebrated for their beauty and serenity. The estate, it seemed, had vanished without a trace, its memory fading into legend. Yet the descriptions of the gardens bore an uncanny resemblance to the courtyard I witnessed each night. Was it possible that the inn, built upon the foundations of this forgotten estate, served as a conduit to the past, a lens through which the lost gardens were revealed? My questions multiplied, each answer leading to further mysteries. The innkeeper, seeing the depth of my interest, shared whispers of the land's power of ley lines and ancient magic that coursed beneath the soil. The courtyard, she believed, was a nexus of this energy, a focal point where the veil between times grew thin. Armed with this knowledge, I resolved to venture into the courtyard at night, to stand among the shadows and whispers of the past. The decision was fraught with apprehension, a step into the unknown that I could not resist. As twilight deepened, I waited for the moment when the brick wall would yield to the enchanting vista of the courtyard. And then it happened. The wall shimmered, fading like mist under the morning sun, revealing the cobblestone paths and verdant floor of the courtyard. Heart racing, I stepped through the window, my feet touching the cool stones, the sounds of the night crisp in my ears. The courtyard was alive, yet I moved among the spectral figures unnoticed, a ghost among ghosts. The fountain's water sang a melody of ages past, and the air was filled with the scent of flowers long extinct. It was a world out of time, beautiful and haunting. As I wandered, drawn to the fountain at the courtyard's heart, I noticed a figure detached from the rest, its gaze locked on me. Unlike the others, there was awareness in its eyes, a consciousness that saw me not as a shadow but as a living, breathing intruder in their midst. The figure approached its form becoming clearer with each step. A woman, dressed in the garb of a bygone era, her expression one of curiosity and caution. You do not belong here, she spoke, her voice a whisper that carried the weight of centuries. Why have you come? And I tried to speak, to explain my presence, but words failed me. The connection between us, fragile and fleeting, was a bridge across time, a link forged by the land's ancient magic. She studied me, a silent assessment that felt as if she peered into the very depths of my soul. The veil has been crossed, she continued, but it cannot remain so. You must return before the dawn, or be lost in the between forever. Her warning was clear, a directive that carried an urgency I could not ignore. As the night waned, I made my way back to the window, the courtyard fading behind me as I crossed the threshold into my room. The brick wall returned, solid and unyielding, as the first light of dawn painted the sky. 
The experience left me changed, a witness to the impossible, a traveler who had walked in a world that was not his own. The courtyard and its inhabitants remained, a nightly spectacle viewed from the safety of my room, but the knowledge of what lay beyond the veil haunted me. On my last night at the inn, I watched the courtyard disappear with the coming of the dawn, a final farewell to a mystery that would linger in my thoughts, a story only half told. The inn, the courtyard, and the spectral figures were a riddle wrapped in the enigma of the land, a puzzle that I had barely begun to unravel. As I departed the Sylvan Retreat, the innkeeper's words echoed in my mind. Some secrets, she had said, are meant to remain hidden, their truths too heavy for the world of the living. The courtyard with a view that didn't exist by day was one such secret, a glimpse into the past that would forever color my understanding of the world. Story 23 The quaint facade of the Grand Oak Hotel, with its Victorian architecture and sprawling gardens, had always been a subject of fascination for me. Nestled in the heart of an old, sleepy town, the hotel promised a retreat from the cacophony of urban life, a slice of history preserved in time. Little did I know, my stay would unveil a chilling chapter of its storied past. Upon my arrival, the receptionist, a young woman with an air of melancholy about her, checked me in with a smile that barely touched her eyes. She handed me the key to room 214, a suite on the second floor overlooking the ancient oak trees from which the hotel derived its name. The room was elegantly furnished, a testament to the hotel's glorious past, but it was the peculiar scratching sound that caught my attention on the first night. The scratching was subtle, a soft, rhythmic noise emanating from beneath the floorboards, as if someone were signaling for attention. I dismissed it as the workings of an old building settling into the quiet of the night. However, as the nights progressed, the scratching grew more desperate, a persistent echo in the darkness that frayed the edges of my nerves. Curiosity mixed with unease led me to explore the hotel's history, seeking an explanation for the unsettling sounds. The Grand Oak Hotel, once a grandiose family mansion, had been converted into a hotel in the early 20th century. Its transformation had seen it play host to countless guests, each leaving their mark on its history. But it was the hotel's period as a secretive government facility during the war that piqued my interest. Records of its activities during this time were sealed, shrouded in mystery. The scratching continued, night after night, a constant reminder that something lay beneath, hidden from view. It followed a pattern, I realized, a repetitive sequence that mirrored the dots and dashes of Morse code. H-E-L-P it spelled, a desperate plea from the darkness below. On my final night I gathered the courage to mention the scratching to the receptionist as I checked out. Her reaction was a mixture of fear and resignation, her pallor a stark contrast to the warm glow of the morning sun. The hotel was built over an old cemetery, she whispered, her voice barely audible. But they had been assured it was empty before construction began. The revelation sent a chill down my spine, the implications of her words slowly dawning on me. The scratching, the Morse code, the desperate plea for help all pointed to a restless presence beneath the hotel, a remnant of its hidden past. Driven by a need to uncover the truth, I embarked on a journey through the town's archives, delving into old newspapers and public records. The truth I unearthed was more horrifying than I had imagined. In the 1920s, a devastating fire had engulfed part of the hotel, claiming several lives. Those who perished were buried in an unmarked grave, their existence erased from history, but not from the memory of the land. The hotel, in its quest for expansion, had built over this forgotten cemetery, disturbing the final resting place of those lost souls. The scratching, the Morse code message, was their cry for recognition, a plea from beyond the grave for their story to be told. Haunted by the knowledge of the hotel's tragic past, I could not simply walk away. I began a campaign to honor the memory of those who had perished in the fire to bring their forgotten story to light. The process was arduous, met with resistance from those who wished to keep the past buried. But perseverance and the support of the local community eventually led to the establishment of a memorial on the hotel grounds, a tribute to the lives that had been lost. The Grand Oak Hotel, once a beacon of luxury and history, now stood as a reminder of the past's hold on the present. 
The scratching ceased, the plea for help silenced by the recognition of those long forgotten. My stay at the hotel had started as a retreat from the world, but it ended with a deeper understanding of the stories that buildings and the land itself can hold. The experience left me changed, more aware of the echoes of history that surround us, often hidden, but ever present. The Grand Oak Hotel's secret was a testament to the fact that the past, no matter how deeply buried, will find a way to speak, to be acknowledged and remembered. Story 24 Nestled on the edge of a vibrant metropolis stood the Bellevue Hotel, a grand structure of Victorian design, its spires reaching towards the sky as if in silent proclamation of its storied past. The hotel, renowned for its opulence and the mysteries enveloping its history, had always intrigued me. Thus, when the opportunity arose to spend a week within its hallowed walls, I seized it with an enthusiasm reserved for the pursuit of the unknown. Room 517, assigned to me upon check-in, was a testament to the hotel's dedication to preserving the elegance of a bygone era. Heavy drapes framed the large windows, and an ornate chandelier cast a soft glow across the room. Yet, amidst the luxury, a pervasive chill lingered in the air, centralized in one corner of the room. No matter the setting of the thermostat or the warmth radiated by the summer sun, this corner remained icy cold, a pocket of winter in an otherwise comfortable environment. Initially, I attributed the cold spot to a quirk of the hotel's ancient plumbing or perhaps a flaw in the heating system. However, as the days passed, the peculiarity of the situation became apparent. Near the cold spot, my electronics malfunctioned, their screens flickering and batteries draining with alarming speed. At night, faint, indistinct murmurs permeated the silence, voices without source, speaking words I could never quite understand. Intrigued and unnerved in equal measure, I inquired about the phenomenon at the front desk. The staff member, a young man with a practiced smile, hesitated before responding. Part of the hotel was rebuilt after a devastating fire in the 1920s that claimed several lives. He mentioned offhandedly, as if recounting a well-rehearsed legend. But sir, I assure you, the hotel is completely safe. His words, meant to be reassuring, only fueled my curiosity. A fire? Rebuilt sections? Lives lost? The hotel's luxurious facade seemed to hide a tragic tale a story that had left its mark in the form of an inexplicable cold spot. Driven by a desire to uncover the truth, I delved into the hotel's history. The fire of 1924 had indeed been a cataclysmic event, gutting a significant portion of the building and resulting in the untimely demise of several guests. The cold spot, it seemed, lay directly above the area most affected by the blaze. As I pieced together the narrative of that fateful night, the murmurs grew more persistent, the voices clearer. They spoke of panic, of smoke-filled corridors and flames that devoured everything in their path. The cold spot, a memorial to the tragedy, seemed to echo the despair of those caught in the inferno. Determined to delve deeper, I arranged for a late-night visit to the hotel's archives with the help of a sympathetic staff member. There, among dusty ledgers and yellowed photographs, I discovered the names of those who had perished, their stories untold, their memories fading with each passing year. The realization that the hotel stood as a silent witness to their suffering weighed heavily on me. The cold spot was not merely a quirk of architecture, or an anomaly of the heating system it was a manifestation of the tragic past, a remnant of the souls lost to the fire. With a newfound respect for the history encapsulated within the hotel's walls, I returned to room 517. The cold spot awaited, a tangible reminder of the lives cut short. And as I sat there in the chill of their memory, I understood that some places hold onto the past more tightly than others, their stories etched into the very fabric of their being. The voices, once indistinct, now spoke with clarity, a chorus of the lost. They did not seek vengeance or retribution, only acknowledgement, a recognition of their existence and their plight. As my stay came to an end, I left room 517 with a heavy heart. The Bellevue Hotel, with its grandeur and elegance, had revealed its secret, entrusting me with the memory of those who could no longer speak for themselves. The inexplicable cold spot, a testament to the tragedy, ensured that their stories, though silent, would never be forgotten.
In the shadow of the Bellevue spires, I made a silent vow to honor the memory of those lost to the flames, to ensure that their stories, preserved in the chill of room 517, would continue to be heard, a reminder of the past that shapes our present. Story 25 The allure of the Hazelwood Inn had always been its blend of comfort and mystery. Tucked away in a sleepy town, its reputation for hospitality was matched only by the whispered stories of its peculiar history. My curiosity peaked. I booked a stay, eager to experience its charm and uncover its secrets. Upon arrival, the warmth of the lobby, with its crackling fireplace and antique furnishings, welcomed me, a stark contrast to the chill of the autumn air outside. The receptionist, a kindly old man with a gentle demeanor, handed me the key to room 413. I hope you'll find your stay comfortable, he said, his smile tinged with a hint of melancholy. The room was elegant, spacious and inviting, with a large window that offered a view of the surrounding forest, its trees a riot of fall colors. But it was the closet that caught my attention, a collection of personal items left behind, as if their owner had vanished into thin air. Among the items were clothes, neatly folded but with a layer of dust, as if untouched for years. A watch, its hands frozen at 3.07, a wallet filled with cash, and a collection of photographs of places I couldn't recognize. The presence of these belongings, so personal and intimate, filled the room with an air of unresolved mystery. Compelled to learn more, I inquired at the front desk about the previous occupant of room 413. The receptionist's face turned pale, his eyes darting away as if hiding a secret. There's been no record of a guest staying in that room for quite some time. He finally admitted, his voice barely a whisper. The inconsistency between his words and the items I found was troubling, suggesting a story untold, a piece of the inn's history kept hidden. My nights at the Hazelwood Inn were restless, haunted by thoughts of the room's last occupant. The belongings in the closet seemed to carry a weight, a silent plea for their story to be uncovered. It was as if the room itself was a puzzle, and these items were the key to solving it. Determined to uncover the truth, I began my own investigation. Conversations with the townsfolk revealed tales of the inn's past, of guests who came seeking solace but found themselves caught in the web of its mysteries. The inn, it seemed, was a magnet for the unexplained, a place where the boundaries between the known and the unknown blurred. One story, in particular, struck a chord. Years ago, a guest had checked into room 413, a traveler with no past and no stories to tell. He was a man shrouded in mystery, his days spent wandering the forests and his nights cloaked in silence. Then, one day he disappeared, leaving behind only his belongings, a silent testament to his existence. The revelation was a turning point, a clue that led me deeper into the inn's secrets. The room, with its view of the forest, seemed to hold a connection to the guest's disappearance, a link to the land itself. Theories abounded, from secret passages hidden within the inn to the notion that the forest was a gateway to realms beyond our understanding. My search for answers led me to an old journal, hidden in the inn's library, its pages yellowed with age. The journal belonged to the inn's original owner, an eccentric figure obsessed with the supernatural. Within its pages were notes on rituals and experiments, attempts to breach the veil between worlds. Room 413, it was revealed, was the focal point of these experiments, a nexus of energy that could open doorways to the unknown. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to the room, the personal items in the closet now taking on a new significance. They were not merely belongings left behind, but markers of a journey beyond the confines of our reality. The man who vanished had not simply left the inn he had crossed into another world, leaving only echoes of his presence behind. The realization was both exhilarating and terrifying. The Hazelwood Inn, with its history of mystery and the supernatural, held secrets that were both beautiful and frightening. Room 413, with its view of the ever-changing forest, was a gateway to the unknown a reminder of the thin veil that separates our world from the worlds that lie just beyond our reach. As I packed my belongings, ready to leave the inn, I felt a sense of connection to the guest who had vanished. In seeking the mysteries of the Hazelwood Inn, I had touched the edges of the unknown, glimpsed the possibilities that exist beyond the boundaries of our understanding. 
The Hazelwood Inn remained, a beacon of mystery in the quiet town, its secrets preserved by the passage of time. The belongings in room 413, a testament to the inn's enigmatic past, remained untouched, a puzzle for another guest to ponder, a story waiting to be uncovered. Story 26 Upon entering the majestic facade of the Cumberland Hotel, I was immediately struck by the air of luxury that pervaded its halls. With its rich history and reputation for exquisite service, the hotel was a beacon for those seeking the comfort of the past wrapped in the opulence of the present. My room, a lavish suite on the fourth floor, promised a stay of unparalleled comfort. However, an inexplicable chill greeted me as I crossed the threshold, a cold spot in one corner that defied the warmth that filled the rest of the space. Initially, I dismissed the chill as a quirk of the hotel's old heating system, but as the days passed, the anomaly became more pronounced. The area near the cold spot seemed to disrupt the function of my electronics, and faint, indistinct murmurs filled the air, whispers from an unseen source. The phenomena piqued my curiosity, a mystery nestled within the walls of my room, urging me to delve deeper into the hotel's storied past. In my quest for answers, I learned from the staff that the Cumberland Hotel had undergone several renovations over the decades. The most significant of these followed a devastating fire in the 1920s that claimed several lives. Part of the hotel was rebuilt over the ashes of the tragedy, a new foundation laid atop the remnants of the past. The cold spot in my room, it was whispered, coincided with the heart of the inferno, the epicenter of the blaze that had left an indelible mark on the hotel's history. The staff spoke of the cold spot with a mix of reverence and fear, a testament to the tragedy that had unfolded decades ago. Some believed it to be a manifestation of the unrestful spirits of those who perished, trapped within the confines of the hotel, their whispers a plea for recognition, for peace. Driven by a blend of empathy and intrigue, I sought the expertise of local historians and paranormal investigators, eager to understand the phenomena that had so thoroughly captivated my attention. The historians confirmed the hotel's controversial origins, detailing the fire's aftermath and the decision to rebuild, a move that had been met with opposition from the community. The land, they revealed, was steeped in history, its layers telling stories of joy and tragedy of beginnings and endings. The paranormal investigators offered a different perspective, suggesting that the cold spot was a gateway, a thinning of the veil between the living and the dead. Their equipment, sensitive to changes in electromagnetic fields, buzzed with activity near the cold spot, a chorus of beeps and static that seemed to confirm their theories. As I delved deeper into the mystery, the cold spot became a focal point of my stay, the center of a personal journey into the unknown. The whispers grew more distinct, a cacophony of voices that filled the night, their messages a mosaic of emotions and memories tied to the land on which the hotel stood. And then, as suddenly as they had begun, the phenomena ceased. The cold spot warmed, the electronics functioned without disruption, and the whispers faded into silence. The abrupt end to the activity left me with more questions than answers, a puzzle that seemed to defy resolution. The Cumberland Hotel, with its grandeur and ghosts, stood as a monument to the complexity of history, a reminder that the past is never truly behind us. It exists in the walls that shelter us, in the ground beneath our feet, a constant companion to our journey through time. As I checked out of the hotel, the mystery of the cold spot unresolved, I couldn't help but feel a connection to the land and its stories. The hotel, a keeper of secrets, had offered me a glimpse into the unseen, a reminder that the world is filled with mysteries waiting to be explored, understood, and respected. The Cumberland Hotel remained, a beacon in the heart of the city, its history a tapestry of human experience, woven from threads of joy, sorrow, and the unexplained. And I, once a guest in its halls, left with a story of my own, a tale of the inexplicable cold spot that had briefly opened a door to the past, inviting me to look beyond the surface, into the depths of the unknown. Story 27 The quaint charm of the Marlowe Hotel had always been a subject of fascination for me nestled in the heart of the city yet seemingly untouched by the passage of time. Its storied walls, draped in ivy, whispered tales of a bygone era, 
inviting guests to step into a world where the past lingered in the air like a delicate perfume. My room, a cozy nook on the third floor, was a testament to the hotel's commitment to preserving its heritage, adorned with antique furniture and paintings that held the gaze of ages. It was behind one such painting, a serene landscape of the countryside, that I discovered the old, barely functioning intercom, its presence a relic of the hotel's history. Hidden from view, it seemed forgotten by time, a silent witness to the countless stories that had unfolded within these walls. The first night passed in peaceful slumber, the kind that one finds in places steeped in history. However, as the clock struck midnight on the second night, the intercom crackled to life, its static-laden silence broken by the sounds of someone sobbing and pleading for release. The voice was distant yet clear, filled with a despair so tangible that it sent shivers down my spine. Confused and alarmed, I contacted the front desk, seeking an explanation for this unsettling occurrence. The response was a mixture of surprise and disbelief. The intercom system, they claimed, had been decommissioned decades ago after a notorious incident where a guest was found to be eavesdropping on others. The suggestion that it could somehow transmit the desperate pleas of an unseen individual was met with skepticism. Undeterred, I set out to unravel the mystery of the secret listener. My days were spent combing through the hotel's archives, sifting through records and newspaper clippings that chronicled its illustrious past. Nights were marked by the haunting transmissions from the intercom, each plea more heart-wrenching than the last. The breakthrough came unexpectedly, in the form of an old journal tucked away in the library's restricted section. It belonged to the hotel's original owner, a man whose vision had brought the Marlowe to life. Within its pages I found mention of a hidden room, a secret space within the hotel where the owner would retreat to listen to the lives of his guests, an eavesdropper ensconced in the shadows of his own creation. Armed with this knowledge, I confronted the hotel's current management, demanding access to the hidden room. Reluctantly, they acquiesced, leading me through a labyrinth of corridors to a door concealed behind a movable panel in the wall. The room was a time capsule, untouched by the years that had passed since its last occupant. Dust-covered monitors and recording equipment filled the space, each screen showing a different part of the hotel. And there, among the antiquated technology, was the intercom, its light flickering with each transmission. As I listened, the voice on the intercom grew more frantic, its messages a jumble of words and sobs. With a sense of growing horror, I realized that the voice was not transmitting from another room but from within the walls of the hidden space. The recordings, it seemed, were not live but echoes of the past, trapped within the equipment, replaying the desperate pleas of a soul long departed. The discovery shook the hotel to its core, revealing a dark chapter in its history that had been buried in the pursuit of preserving its facade of grandeur. The hidden room was sealed, the recordings archived with the promise of a thorough investigation. As for me, the encounter with the secret listener left an indelible mark, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the seen from the unseen. The Marlowe Hotel, with its secrets unveiled, stood as a testament to the complexities of human nature, a place where the past and present intertwined, whispering tales of joy, sorrow, and redemption. Story 28 Nestled within the bustling streets of the city, the Meridian Hotel stood as a testament to elegance and mystery. Its towering facade, a blend of modern and gothic architecture, hinted at the stories held within its walls. My fascination with the hotel's history, marked by tales of secret gatherings and whispers of the occult, had led me here, eager to uncover the layers of stories veiled behind its luxurious veneer. Upon entering my room, a grand suite adorned with antique furniture and rich tapestries, a painting caught my eye. Positioned oddly on the wall, it depicted a serene landscape, a stark contrast to the urban views outside my window. A sense of curiosity, coupled with a feeling that the painting was out of place, prompted me to investigate further. Behind the canvas I discovered an old, barely functioning intercom, its presence a relic of the hotel's storied past. The first night passed in quiet comfort. The city's distance sounds a lullaby that lulled me into a peaceful sleep. However, on the second night, the intercom crackled to life, breaking the silence with the sounds of someone someone sobbing, their pleas for release a haunting melody that echoed through the dark. 
The voice, filled with despair and longing, recounted details of my life, secrets I had never shared, hidden fears and lost dreams spilled out in the open air. Shaken by the experience, I approached the hotel staff the following morning, my mind a whirlwind of questions and fear. The front desk claimed the intercom system had been decommissioned decades ago, following a notorious incident where a guest obsessed with the lives of others was found to be eavesdropping on unsuspecting visitors. Their explanation did little to ease my mind. The mystery of the voice and its intimate knowledge of my life a puzzle that demanded solving. Driven by a need to understand, I delved into the hotel's archives, searching for answers among old records and forgotten stories. My investigation led me to the tale of a theft, a diary stolen from my home years earlier, its contents a collection of personal reflections and secrets. The diary I realized was the key, its loss an event that had haunted me, a violation of my privacy that remained unresolved. The voice on the intercom, recounting details from the diary, suggested a connection to the theft, a thread that linked the past to the present in the most unexpected of ways. My search for the diary's thief, a journey that had grown cold over the years, was reignited in the confines of the Meridian Hotel, a place where the past seemed to converge with the present. The hotel's security footage offered no clues showing no one interacting with me, the conversations recounted by the mysterious voice absent from the visual record. The contradiction between the voice's intimate knowledge and the absence of any evidence of its source deepened the mystery, a riddle wrapped in the enigma of the hotel's silent walls. My nights were consumed by the voice, each plea and recounting of my past a thread that wove a tapestry of fear and intrigue. The intercom, a portal to a past I had tried to forget, became both my tormentor and my only link to uncovering the identity of the voice. In my quest for answers, I encountered tales of the occult, stories of guests who had delved too deeply into the secrets of the Meridian Hotel, their fates a warning to those who dared to uncover what lay hidden. The hotel, it seemed, was a crossroads of the unseen, a place where the barriers between worlds grew thin, where the past could speak to the present in ways that defied explanation. The realization that the voice might be a manifestation of the hotel's mysterious energies, a spirit or entity bound to the place, offered a new perspective on the haunting. Perhaps the intercom was a conduit, a means for the unseen to communicate with the living, the details of my life known through the stolen diary a bridge that connected us across the boundaries of time and space. As my stay at the Meridian Hotel drew to a close, the voice faded, its pleas and recountings becoming a distant whisper. The mystery of the secret listener, the guest who knew my name and the secrets of my past, remained unsolved a chapter in my life that closed with more questions than answers. Leaving the hotel, I couldn't shake the feeling that the Meridian held secrets far beyond the understanding of its guests, that my experience was but a glimpse into the depths of its mysteries. The stolen diary, the voice on the intercom, and the hotel's storied past had intertwined, weaving a story that would linger in my mind, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the known from the unknown. The Meridian Hotel, with its elegant facade and whispered tales, stood as a beacon of mystery, a place where the past could reach out to the present, where the voices of those long gone could still be heard by those willing to listen. Story 29 The peculiarities of the Oracle Hotel had always been a source of fascination for both locals and visitors alike. Its reputation for the extraordinary, for events and occurrences that defied logical explanation, had drawn me to its doors, a writer in search of stories hidden in the folds of the unknown. What I encountered, however, was something beyond even my wildest imaginings. Upon arrival, I was greeted with the kind of warm, attentive service the hotel was renowned for, but there was a palpable undercurrent of mystery in the air, a sense that the walls of the Oracle Hotel whispered secrets passed down through generations. It was during check-in that I first encountered the anomaly that would define my stay a reservation made in my name, extending years into the future with detailed notes that thanked me for my past visits and outlined specific requests for my next stay. The handwriting on the reservation notes matched mine to an uncanny degree, a mirror image of my own that sent a shiver down my spine. I had no memory of making these reservations, nor of the visits the notes alluded to. The hotel staff, unfazed, informed me that these bookings were made decades ago, 
with explicit instructions to renew them indefinitely. The room assigned to me was a study in luxury, a space that seemed to straddle the line between the past and the present with its blend of antique furnishings and modern conveniences. It was here, in the quiet solitude of the room, that I began to unravel the mystery of the unchangeable reservation. Night after night I pored over the notes, each word a breadcrumb on a trail that led through the labyrinth of my own past and the hotel's enigmatic history. The more I delved into the mystery, the more I became convinced that the answers I sought were not bound by the conventional flow of time. The Oracle Hotel, as I learned, was built by an eccentric millionaire with a fascination for the boundaries of reality. Its foundation was laid atop a site believed by many to be a nexus of supernatural energies, a place where the fabric of time was thin and malleable. The hotel itself was designed to be a conduit for these energies, a space where the impossible could manifest with startling regularity. It was within this context that the nature of my unchangeable reservations began to take on a new, startling dimension. The notes, the requests, they were communications from myself, not from the past, but from the future. The hotel, with its unique position at the crossroads of time, had facilitated a connection between my present and my future selves, a loop of causality that defied linear understanding. Armed with this realization, I embarked on a quest to understand the purpose of these messages from the future, to decipher the intent behind the cryptic requests and the expressions of gratitude for stays I had no memory of. Each clue uncovered in the hotel's archives, each anomaly experienced within its walls, brought me closer to the truth. The journey was one of self-discovery, of coming to terms with the notion that our lives are not merely our own, but are intertwined with the myriad possibilities that exist within the tapestry of time. The Oracle Hotel, with its timeless elegance and its heart of mystery, had chosen me to bear witness to this truth, to understand that we are all, in some way, guests in our own lives, making reservations for futures we have yet to imagine. As my investigation drew to a close, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place, revealing a picture of a life lived in the shadow of the extraordinary. The unchangeable reservations were not a burden, but a gift, a reminder that the journey is as important as the destination, and that the paths we walk are woven from the threads of past, present, and future. Leaving the Oracle Hotel behind, I stepped out into the world with a new sense of purpose, a writer forever changed by the story that had chosen him as its scribe. The hotel, with its whispered secrets and its timeless allure, remained a beacon for those seeking to explore the mysteries of existence, a place where the impossible was simply another aspect of the guest experience. And as for me, I knew that my reservations at the Oracle Hotel would continue, a standing invitation to return, to explore the depths of the unknown, and to write the stories that awaited me in the spaces between moments, in the hotel that defied time itself. Story 30 the Lachlan Gallery Hotel, renowned for its integration of art within the hospitality experience, promised a unique stay, blending the comfort of luxury accommodation with the awe of living among masterpieces. Each room was a curated exhibit, the paintings on the walls more than mere decoration they were windows to the souls of the artists who created them. My fascination with art led me to book a stay, eager to immerse myself in the visual narratives that adorned the hotel's walls. Upon arrival, my room presented a breathtaking view of a vibrant garden scene, alive with colors that seemed to pulse with life, a testament to the artist's skill in capturing the essence of nature. The painting, positioned prominently above the bed, was a focal point of the room, its beauty a source of immediate captivation. However, as night fell and the shadows lengthened, a transformation began. The vibrant scene started to decay, the colors dimming, the flora withering, transforming into an overgrown wasteland by morning. The change was not limited to this single piece other paintings in the room followed suit, each aging overnight, their subjects descending into derelict versions of their former selves. Disturbed by this phenomenon, I sought answers from the hotel staff, who shared the history of the artist a figure shrouded in mystery and tragedy. The artist had intended to capture the inevitable decay of all things, employing a unique, reactive paint that aged in response to the environment, a physical manifestation of the passage of time and the impermanence of beauty. The revelation of the painting's intent did little to ease the disquiet that had settled over me. 
The transformation of the art from vibrant life to desolate decay served as a stark reminder of the transitory nature of existence, a theme that resonated deeply within the confines of my room. Compelled to understand more, I delved into the history of the Lachlan Gallery Hotel, discovering its past as a haven for artists seeking refuge from the turmoil of the world. The hotel, it seemed, was more than a mere collection of rooms and artworks. It was a sanctuary where the boundaries between art and life blurred, where the echoes of the past found voice in the present. The phenomenon of the aging paintings, while unsettling, became a subject of fascination. Each night, I witnessed the transformation, a silent observer to the passage of time captured in the strokes of a brush. The art, ever-changing, reflected the cycles of life and decay, a perpetual dance of creation and destruction. As my stay drew to a close, the echoing goodbyes of the past seemed to permeate the very walls of the hotel, a sorrowful lament for all that was lost to time. The staff, accustomed to the peculiarities of the hotel, mentioned that occasionally, the past seemed to bleed into the present, the memories of the hotel's former life as a farewell point for soldiers heading to war, leaving an indelible mark on its essence. Leaving the Lachlan Gallery Hotel, I carried with me not just the memories of a unique stay, but a deeper appreciation for the power of art to convey the complexities of the human condition. The paintings that aged, transforming before my eyes, served as a profound reminder of the fleeting beauty of life and the relentless march of time. The hotel, with its living galleries, stood as a monument to the interplay between art and existence, a place where the past and the present converged leaving an echo of goodbyes that lingered long after the dawn. Story 31 It began as a trivial annoyance, a minor disturbance in the early days of my month-long stay at the historic Alcott Hotel. Nestled in the heart of a city famed for its blend of modern vibrancy and gothic architecture, the Alcott boasted a legacy of housing various luminaries and eccentrics through the decades. It was this storied past, along with its purportedly untouched 19th century decor that drew me in a writer in search of inspiration for a novel set in an era where gas lamps lined foggy cobblestone streets and secrets lurked in every shadowed corner. My room, 317, was a time capsule, its walls adorned with velvet wallpaper that had seen better days, and its floor creaked under the weight of history. The massive, ornate clock that sat atop the fireplace mantel ticked away the seconds with an authority that felt almost conscious, as if it were the beating heart of the room itself. But it was the alarm clock, an incongruously modern black digital device on the nightstand, that first hinted at the peculiar nature of my stay. On the first night, after a long day of exploring the city and its many bookshops, I set the alarm for 7 a.m., hoping to start the next day early. Sleep came easily, the kind that only the exhaustion of travel can induce. But it was abruptly shattered by the shrill beep of the alarm clock at precisely 2.17 a.m. Groggily, I reached out to silence it, puzzled by the untimely wake up. Assuming I had somehow mismanaged the settings, I checked the time I had set it remained at 7 a.m. Shrugging it off to a glitch or a mistake on my part, I fell back into a restless sleep. The same occurrence repeated the next night, and the night after that. Each time the alarm went off at 2.17 a.m., despite no evidence of it being set for that hour. By the fourth night, a blend of irritation and curiosity compelled me to leave the alarm unset. Yet, at 2.17 a.m., it rang again. It was on the fifth night that the situation took a turn towards the truly bizarre. As the clock displayed 2.17 a.m., instead of the usual beep, the alarm clock's radio turned on, emitting a low, static-filled hum. Through the white noise, a whisper emerged, soft and insidious, repeating names with a chilling familiarity. The first name sent a shiver down my spine, Isabel Carmichael, a renowned actress of the silent film era, known to have vanished under mysterious circumstances while staying at the Alcott. The whispers continued, each name belonging to a historical figure or celebrity who had graced the hotel with their presence only to meet unexplained tragedies or disappearances. My initial thought was to record these occurrences, both for evidence and in a hope that I might be experiencing some form of auditory hallucination brought on by stress or fatigue. Yet, 
Every attempt to capture the phenomenon failed. The recordings captured only silence at the time the voices spoke. Driven by a mix of fear and fascination, I began to research the hotel's history in earnest. The Alcott had been built in the late 1800s by a wealthy industrialist, Edward Alcott, whose own demise was as enigmatic as those of his hotel's infamous pests. The local archives and online forums revealed tales of hidden rooms, secret passages, and unexplained phenomena, but nothing concrete that could explain the voices or the alarm's inexplicable behavior. As days turned to weeks, the nightly occurrences evolved. The voices became clearer, now engaging in eerie conversations about events from their lives, discussions filled with sorrow, anger, or unfulfilled desires. It felt as though the radio served as a conduit, a window to a time and space where the hotel's most troubled souls lingered. I spent my days wandering the hotel, speaking to staff and other guests, though none admitted to experiencing anything unusual. Yet, there were moments fleeting glimpses of something just out of the corner of my eye, or a feeling of being watched. That suggested I was not alone in my experiences. Halfway through my stay, I discovered a hidden drawer within the room's ancient writing desk. Inside, I found a collection of personal belongings, a locket, a fountain pen, a small leather-bound diary, all items that, upon further research, belonged to guests who had vanished or died at the Alcott. It was as if the room itself was a keeper of secrets, holding on to the last vestiges of those who could not leave. Compelled by a sense of responsibility to those voices, I began to document everything, piecing together the stories of the whispered names. Each night, as the clock approached 2.17 a.m., I sat by the alarm, listening, recording my observations in writing, a silent witness to the hotel's hidden legacy. The culmination of my experiences at the Alcott came unexpectedly on my last night. As the familiar static of the alarm clock began, a new voice spoke, clear and commanding, identifying itself as Edward Alcott. He spoke of his vision for the hotel, a haven for the brilliant and the broken, and his own demise, a sacrifice to protect the secrets within its walls. With his final words, the room trembled, a gust of wind extinguishing the candles, plunging me into darkness. When the lights returned, the alarm clock was gone, as were the items in the hidden drawer. The room felt different, lighter, as if a weight had been lifted. The next morning I checked out of the Alcott, my novel forgotten, replaced by a new mission to tell the true story of the Alcott Hotel and its silent inhabitants. As I passed through the grand lobby for the last time, I couldn't shake the feeling that the eyes and the portraits lining the walls followed me, whispering their thanks for hearing their stories. The Alcott's mysteries remained, its history a tangled web of truth and speculation. But for a brief moment, I had touched something beyond the veil, a reminder that some places hold on to their past, whispering it to those who are willing to listen. Continuing from the unsettling revelations and the ethereal encounter in the historic Alcott Hotel, my departure was marked by a profound sense of transformation. The hotel, with its labyrinthine corridors and whispered secrets, had imprinted upon me an indelible curiosity and a newfound purpose. The city, once a mere backdrop for my intended novel, now seemed alive with untold stories, each street corner whispering tales of the past, urging me to listen. The weeks following my stay at the Alcott were consumed by research and interviews. I tracked down descendants of those whispered names, historians specializing in the city's obscure past, and former employees of the hotel, each conversation unearthing layers of history buried under the veneer of time. The more I learned, the more the line between fact and folklore blurred, painting a picture of a hotel not merely as a building but as an entity, a keeper of secrets and stories, standing at the threshold between the seen and the unseen. One particularly chilling account came from an elderly woman, the granddaughter of Isabel Carmichael. Her grandmother's disappearance had been a family mystery spoken of in hushed tones. She shared with me letters Isabel had written during her stay at the Alcott, describing vivid dreams of conversations with Edward Alcott, dreams that felt unnervingly real. The letters ceased abruptly after Isabel's last recorded night at the hotel, her final correspondence speaking of a revelation she intended to share upon her return a revelation that never came. Armed with these stories and the haunting experience of my own, I began to write not a novel, 
but a non-fiction account that sought to bridge the gap between the hotel's public history and its private hauntings. The process was cathartic, each word a tribute to those voices that had broken through the veil in room 317. My manuscript attracted the attention of a small but reputable publisher specializing in historical mysteries and paranormal accounts. The publication process was swift, propelled by a growing public fascination with the Alcott Hotel, now rumored to be haunted by the souls of its illustrious past. Upon the book's release, I returned to the Alcott, invited by its current owners who had embraced the hotel's eerie legacy as a draw for tourists and thrill-seekers. They hosted a book signing in the Grand Ballroom, a space adorned with crystal chandeliers and golden accents, a stark contrast to the shadowed corners and whispered secrets of room 317. As I signed copies of my book, an elderly man approached, his eyes reflecting a depth of knowledge and sorrow. He introduced himself as Jonathan Alcott, a direct descendant of Edward Alcott. His family had long distanced themselves from the hotel and its dark history, but my book had compelled him to reach out. Jonathan shared with me a family legend, passed down through generations, of a pact Edward Alcott had made with something ancient and formless, a being that promised prosperity and fame in exchange for the hotel serving as a crossroads for souls, a place where the veil between worlds was thin. This pact, Jonathan believed, was the source of the hotel's hauntings, a magnet for both the living and the dead. Our conversation deepened my understanding of the Alcott's mysteries and fueled a sequel focusing on the Alcott family and the origins of the hotel's haunted legacy. My research took me across the world, tracing the Alcott's lineage and the esoteric knowledge that Edward had sought, uncovering a tapestry of occult practices and spiritualism that had flourished in the late 19th century. The second book delved into the complexities of the spiritual and the material, proposing that places like the Alcott Hotel serve as anchors, points where stories and souls linger, refusing to be forgotten. It sparked debate and curiosity, drawing more visitors to the hotel, each hoping to catch a glimpse of the beyond. Years have passed since my first night in room 317, but the Alcott remains a significant part of my life. I've returned numerous times, each visit revealing new whispers, new stories longing to be heard. The hotel has changed hands, renovated and modernized, but the heart of it, the essence that Edward Alcott had imbued within its walls remains unchanged. As I sit in the renovated lobby, now a blend of modern chic and gothic grandeur, I can't help but feel the eyes of the past upon me, the whispered names and untold stories swirling in the air. The Alcott Hotel stands as a monument to the unseen, a reminder that history is not just the events recorded in books but the stories etched in the shadows, waiting for someone to listen, to remember. Story 32 The discovery was as unexpected as it was chilling, hidden beneath layers of forgotten garments in an antique dresser that stood against the wall of my hotel room. I had checked into the Grand Marais, a secluded hotel nestled on the cliffs overlooking the tumultuous sea, hoping for a retreat to clear my mind and rejuvenate my spirits after months of unyielding stress. The Grand Marais, with its history of mystery and allure, promised solitude and escape, However, what I found amidst its decaying elegance was far from the peace I sought. The stack of letters, yellowed with age, lay tied together with a faded ribbon, their presence a stark anomaly in the otherwise empty drawer. Curiosity peaked, I untied the bundle, the brittle paper crackling under my touch. The top letter, dated several years prior, was addressed to a name I faintly recognized from news headlines a journalist who had disappeared while investigating reports of paranormal activity in various parts of the world. With a growing sense of unease, I began to read. The letter was a desperate plea for help, its author detailing experiences of haunting visions, voices whispering in the night, and an oppressive sense of being watched. The descriptions mirrored my own fleeting sensations since arriving at the Grand Marais, feelings I had dismissed as products of my overwrought imagination. Each subsequent letter, addressed to different individuals who had similarly vanished, recounted similar tales of terror, all within the hotel's walls. The realization that I was not alone in my experiences, that others had felt this same dread and had sought help only to disappear, sent a cold shiver down my spine. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to investigate the history of the Grand Marais and its guests. 
My inquiries began with the hotel staff, who met my questions with evasive glances and terse replies, suggesting that the subject was taboo. Undeterred, I turned to the local archives, spending days poring over old newspapers, journals, and any documents that mentioned the Grand Marais. The pattern that emerged was unnerving over the years. Numerous guests had disappeared without a trace, their last known whereabouts being the hotel. Armed with this knowledge, I confronted the hotel manager, a stoic man who had initially greeted me with polite indifference. Faced with the evidence, his demeanor shifted to one of resigned acceptance. In a hushed tone, he shared the legend of the Grand Marais, a tale of a cursed foundation built atop land that was once a sacred site, desecrated by the hotel's construction. The spirits of the land, he claimed, were restless, seeking vengeance on those who dared to intrude upon their domain. The manager's story, while fantastical, provided a context for the letters and my own experiences. The hotel, it seemed, was a nexus for the supernatural, a place where the veil between worlds was perilously thin. The letters were not merely pleas for help, they were warnings, left by those who had sensed the danger too late. Driven by a need to understand and, perhaps, to put an end to the cycle of disappearances, I delved deeper into the lore surrounding the hotel, seeking out local historians and paranormal experts. My research led me to the discovery of ancient rituals and rites meant to appease restless spirits, practices long abandoned in the modern age. The more I learned, the more I became convinced that the solution to the hotel's curse lay in these forgotten traditions. With the reluctant assistance of the hotel staff, who seemed to share a collective desire to rid the Grand Marais of its haunting legacy, I organized a ceremony aimed at appeasing the spirits, a ritual that would require the full moon's light to complete. As the appointed night arrived, the hotel's atmosphere was charged with a palpable sense of anticipation and dread. The staff and I, along with a small group of guests who had chosen to remain despite the circumstances, gathered on the cliffside the moon casting an eerie glow over the churning sea below. The ritual was complex, requiring precise chants and offerings that we had prepared in the days leading up to the ceremony. As we proceeded, the air around us grew colder, the wind rising in a mournful howl that seemed to carry the voices of the lost. The sensation of being watched intensified, pressing in on us from all sides. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the pressure lifted. The air warmed, and the wind quieted to a gentle breeze. A sense of peace, profound and all-encompassing, settled over the Grand Marais, as if the land itself had exhaled a long-held breath of sorrow. In the days that followed, the hotel was transformed. The oppressive atmosphere of dread was gone, replaced by a serene calm that echoed through its halls. Guests reported feeling at ease, their previous unease forgotten, as if lifted by the ritual's completion. As for me, the experience had left an indelible mark, changing my perception of the world and my place within it. The letters, those unsent pleas for help, had set me on a path I could never have anticipated, leading me to confront the unknown and, in doing so, to find a measure of peace for the restless spirits of the Grand Marais. The hotel now stands as a beacon of tranquility, its cursed legacy replaced by tales of renewal and reconciliation with the land. And while the world beyond its walls remains oblivious to the truth of what occurred, those who were part of the ritual carry with them the knowledge that sometimes, the greatest mysteries require a leap of faith to understand. As I prepare to leave the Grand Marais, the letters in hand, I do so with the intention of delivering them to the families of the vanished, a final act of closure for those lost souls. The Grand Marais, with its secrets now laid bare, will continue to welcome guests, its history a testament to the power of belief and the enduring strength of the human spirit. In the wake of the ceremony, the Grand Marais seemed to breathe easier, as though a great weight had been lifted from its aged shoulders. The hotel's transformation was not just metaphysical, the guests began to notice changes too. Rooms that once felt claustrophobic now basked in warmth and sunlight, and areas where shadows lingered now shone brightly, dispelling any remnants of fear. But the story of the Grand Marais and its unsent letters was far from over. The decision to deliver the letters to the families of the vanished became a journey in itself, one that took me across continents and into the lives of those left behind. Each delivery was an emotional pilgrimage, a step toward understanding the depth of loss 
and the hope that still flickered in the hearts of those who had never ceased waiting for answers. Through tear-stained faces and clasped hands, I shared the tales of the Grand Marais, of its haunted past and the ceremony that sought to mend the rift between worlds. While some greeted the stories with skepticism, others saw them as a form of solace, a bridge to the loved ones they had lost. The letters, once pleas for help, transformed into messages of farewell, providing closure to wounds that time alone could not heal. Amidst these journeys, I returned periodically to the Grand Marais, drawn back by an inexplicable bond forged through the ritual. The hotel had become a sanctuary, a place of reflection and connection to the unseen. Guests came and went, some drawn by tales of the hotel's transformation, others by the allure of its secluded beauty. Yet, all seemed to sense the Grand Marais's newfound peace, a testament to the power of reconciliation and respect for the unseen forces that shape our world. The hotel's staff, once tight-lipped and wary, now spoke openly of the Grand Marais's history, sharing stories of its past with a sense of pride rather than fear. The manager, a pivotal figure in the hotel's transformation, became a friend and confidant, his initial skepticism replaced by a deep belief in the importance of harmony between the hotel and the land it occupied. My own connection to the Grand Marais deepened with each visit the hotel offering new insights and revelations. I discovered hidden nooks and crannies, each with its own story to tell, and encountered guests who shared their experiences of the paranormal, now more curious than fearful. These encounters inspired me to document the hotel's journey from a place of haunting to one of healing, a narrative that resonated with those who sought understanding of the mysteries that linger on the fringes of our reality. As the manuscript took shape, I realized that the story of the Grand Marais was not just about a hotel and its guests, it was a reflection of the human condition, of our innate desire to connect with something greater than ourselves, to find meaning in the unexplainable. The book, titled Letters from the Threshold, was a homage to the unsent letters, to the voices that had cried out from the darkness, and to the enduring strength of spirit that had brought light back to the Grand Marais. Upon its publication, letters from the threshold sparked conversations about the nature of hauntings, of the interplay between the living and the dead, and of the possibility of reconciliation with the past. It drew visitors to the Grand Marais, now a place of pilgrimage for those seeking to understand the mysteries of the unseen, to experience the peace that now enveloped the hotel. In the end, the journey that began with the discovery of a bundle of unsent letters had led to a profound transformation, not just of the Grand Marais, but of my own understanding of the world. The hotel stood as a beacon, a reminder that even in places marked by sorrow and loss, there is potential for renewal, for bridges to be built between the past and the present, the seen and the unseen. Story 33 my curiosity was piqued the moment I noticed the peculiar behavior of the hotel elevator. Despite the presence of a button for the fourth floor, the elevator would unerringly pass it by, ascending from the third to the fifth without hesitation. Inquiries to the staff were met with dismissive shrugs or vague responses, suggesting that the fourth floor was simply an unused storage area, not worth the attention of guests. The hotel itself, the Majestic, was a grand old structure, its facade a testament to architectural prowess of a bygone era. It had been refurbished to meet modern standards of comfort and luxury, yet it retained an air of mystery, its long history whispered in the creaks of its floorboards and the murmur of its walls. Driven by a mix of curiosity and an innate sense that there was more to the story, I decided to investigate the fourth floor myself. The staircase leading up from the third floor was dimly lit, the light bulbs casting long shadows that seemed to dance on the aged wallpaper. As I ascended, a sense of anticipation grew, a feeling that I was stepping into a secret kept hidden from the prying eyes of the present. Emerging onto the fourth floor, I was immediately struck by a profound sense of displacement. It was as if I had crossed a threshold into another time. The hallway was adorned with fixtures and furnishings that spoke of decades past, from the faded floral wallpaper to the ornate chandeliers that hung from the ceiling, their crystals dulled by the accumulation of years. The air hummed with a strange energy, a vibration that seemed to resonate from the very walls, pulsing with a rhythm that felt almost alive. The floor was eerily silent, yet there was an undeniable feeling of presence, 
as though the rooms were occupied by unseen occupants, going about their lives oblivious to my intrusion. Driven by a mix of fascination and unease, I began to explore the rooms. Each door was unlocked, opening to reveal interiors that were perfectly preserved relics of a bygone era. The furnishings, the personal items left on dressers and nightstands, even the magazines spread on coffee tables, all were from decades past, untouched by the passage of time. One room in particular caught my attention. It was a corner suite, its windows offering a panoramic view of the city below, though the glass was tinged with the patina of age. The room was filled with personal effects that suggested a long-term inhabitant a collection of vintage dresses in the wardrobe, an array of cosmetics from another era on the vanity, and a typewriter on the desk, a sheet of paper still rolled in its carriage. The air in the room was thick with the perfume of nostalgia, a scent that evoked images of glamorous parties and whispered secrets. Yet, it was the typewriter that drew me closer, an inexplicable compulsion urging me to examine the sheet of paper. Typed in crisp, clear letters was a letter, mid-sentence, as if the writer had been suddenly interrupted and never returned to finish their thought. The date at the top of the page was from over 50 years ago, yet the ink was as fresh as if it had been typed moments before. The realization that I was standing in a room that had somehow remained sealed away from the world, preserved in a bubble of the past, was overwhelming. Questions raced through my mind who had lived here. What had happened to them? And why was this floor hidden from the rest of the hotel? The sound of a door creaking open down the hall snapped me out of my reverie. Heart racing, I stepped out into the hallway, expecting to confront someone, perhaps a staff member coming to investigate my presence. But the corridor was empty, the sound echoing mockingly in the silence. The decision to leave, to return to the familiar reality of the hotel below, was a difficult one. Yet the sense of being watched, of trespassing into a space that was not meant for the living, urged me to retreat. Back in my room, the experience on the fourth floor weighed heavily on my mind. The questions it raised were numerous, but the answers were elusive, hidden within the walls of the majestic itself. The need to understand, to uncover the truth of the fourth floor anomaly, became an obsession. The following days were spent in a fervent search for information. I scoured the hotel's archives, interviewed long-term staff, and delved into the city's historical records, piecing together the story of the Majestic and its mysterious fourth floor. What I discovered was a tale of tragedy and loss, a story that had been buried in the hotel's past. The fourth floor had been the scene of a devastating fire decades ago, a blaze that had claimed the lives of several guests. In the aftermath, the hotel's owners, eager to erase the memory of the tragedy, had sealed the floor away, refurbishing the rest of the hotel and leaving the fourth floor as a tomb, a hidden monument to those lost. Yet, the spirits of those guests, it seemed, had never left. The fourth floor remained their domain, a place where time stood still, where the echoes of their lives continued to resonate. Armed with this knowledge, I approached the hotel's management, urging them to acknowledge the fourth floor, to honor the memories of those who had perished. The resistance was initially strong, the desire to maintain the Majestic's reputation as a beacon of luxury and elegance outweighing the need for truth. But persistence, backed by the evidence I had gathered, gradually wore down their objections. In time, the hotel agreed to a memorial, a recognition of the tragedy that had occurred within its walls. The unveiling of the memorial was a somber affair, attended by descendants of those who had perished, local dignitaries, and the hotel's guests and staff. It was a moment of closure, a healing of wounds long ignored. The fourth floor, once a hidden anomaly, was now a part of the hotel's public history, its story shared with those who walked its halls, and while the spirits of those lost may still linger, their presence is no longer a secret, their memories honored and remembered. Story 34 The day I checked into the Crescent Moon Hotel, I was greeted by an atmosphere that seemed to buzz with an inexplicable energy, a sensation that was both exhilarating and unnerving. Situated on the edge of a serene lake, the hotel was renowned for its breathtaking views and impeccable service. It promised a week of solitude and relaxation, a much-needed escape from the demands of my bustling city life. However, 
what I encountered upon my arrival was far from the retreat I had envisioned. It began with a glance, a reflection in the polished surface of the hotel's grand lobby mirror. At first I thought nothing of it, assuming it was my own tired eyes staring back at me, but as I turned to collect my key from the reception desk I caught sight of the person again. This time, there was no mistaking it, the individual in the mirror was my exact double. The same height, the same build, even the same peculiar shade of green in her eyes that I had always believed to be unique to me. The shock of the encounter left me momentarily speechless. When I finally regained my composure, I approached the figure, only to find them mirroring my movements with uncanny precision. It was as though I was looking at my reflection, yet here we were standing face to face in the center of the hotel's lobby. Initial conversations with my doppelganger were fraught with disbelief and confusion. They knew things about me, details of my childhood, my fears, and my dreams that I had never shared with anyone. It was as if they had lived my life alongside me, privy to my most private thoughts and experiences. The hotel staff's reaction to our encounter added to the surreal nature of the situation. They treated us interchangeably, responding to my doppelganger's requests as if they were my own, despite my protests. It was as though the existence of two identical guests was a normal occurrence, unworthy of special attention or concern. As the days passed, the presence of my doppelganger became a constant source of fascination and unease. They shadowed my movements within the hotel, always present yet somehow distant, a specter that mirrored my existence but remained separate from it. Conversations with them revealed a depth of knowledge about my life that was both intimate and invasive, leading me to question the nature of our connection. The other guests seemed oblivious to the anomaly, interacting with my doppelganger as if they were me, and vice versa. This interchangeability became a source of mounting frustration, blurring the lines of my identity, making me doubt my own memories and experiences. Was I becoming them, or were they becoming me? Driven by a need to understand, I began to investigate the history of the Crescent Moon Hotel, searching for any clues that might explain the appearance of my doppelganger. The hotel's archives, a collection of dusty ledgers and faded photographs, revealed a history of strange occurrences and unexplained phenomena, but nothing that specifically mentioned the appearance of doppelgangers. It was a conversation with an elderly staff member, a bellhop who had been with the hotel for decades, that finally shed light on the mystery. He spoke of a legend, a tale passed down through generations of hotel employees, of a spirit that dwelled within the hotel's walls. This spirit, he claimed, was a mirror of the soul, manifesting as a doppelganger to those who carried a heavy burden, a reflection of their innermost selves made flesh. The revelation was both terrifying and illuminating. My arrival at the Crescent Moon Hotel had come at a time of personal turmoil, a period of my life marked by self-doubt and a search for purpose. But the appearance of my doppelganger, then, was not a random occurrence but a manifestation of my own internal struggles, a physical embodiment of the aspects of myself that I had been unwilling to face. Armed with this knowledge, I sought out my doppelganger, determined to confront the issues that had given rise to their existence. Our final conversation was a catharsis, a release of pent-up emotions and unspoken truths, they listened with a knowing empathy, a silent acknowledgement of the shared soul between us. On the day of my departure, I awoke to find my doppelganger gone, vanished without a trace. The hotel staff, too, seemed to have no recollection of their existence, treating my inquiries with puzzled looks and denials. It was as if they had never been there, a figment of my imagination that had disappeared with the morning light. Yet the impact of the encounter remained. The presence of my doppelganger had forced me to confront the parts of myself I had long ignored, sparking a journey of self-discovery that continued long after I left the Crescent Moon Hotel. In their reflection, I had seen the totality of my being, the light and shadow that constituted my essence. They were a mirror, not of my physical form, but of my soul, a guide that led me to a deeper understanding of myself. The hotel, with its serene beauty and hidden mysteries, had been the catalyst for this transformation, a place where the boundaries between the physical and the spiritual blurred. And while the Crescent Moon Hotel continued to welcome guests, its halls whispering with the echoes of past visitors, my experience remained a deeply personal anomaly, a moment in time where the veil between worlds thinned, 
but revealing the profound connection between our external and internal realities. In the years that followed, I often reflected on my time at the Crescent Moon Hotel, the memories tinged with a sense of wonder and introspection. My encounter with my doppelganger had been a turning point, a pivotal event that reshaped my understanding of identity and existence. And though they had vanished as mysteriously as they had appeared, their presence lingered, a constant reminder of the journey within, of the power of the self to manifest in the most unexpected of ways. Story 35 The first night at the historic Inn of the Whispering Pines was as enchanting as it was serene. The secluded hotel nestled among towering pines and overlooking a moonlit lake. Its reputation for tranquility and timeless beauty had drawn me there, seeking solitude and a reprieve from the relentless pace of urban life. However, the peace I found was punctuated by an occurrence both mysterious and unnerving a nightly procession that defied explanation and logic. It began with the soft whisper of movement outside my door, a sound so faint it could have been dismissed as the rustle of leaves in the wind. Yet, compelled by a sense of curiosity, I peered through the peephole, expecting perhaps a late arriving guest or a member of the staff. Instead, my eyes met a spectacle that left me questioning my sanity. A silent procession of figures drifted by my door, their forms barely distinguishable in the shadowy light of the hallway. They moved with a solemn grace, their attire spanning different eras from the elaborate dresses of the Victorian age to the simpler garments of the early 20th century. Each figure was engrossed in their silent march, paying no heed to my presence behind the door. Night after night, the procession repeated its path, a silent ritual that seemed as much a part of the hotel as the ancient pines that surrounded it. My inquiries to the staff about this nocturnal parade were met with polite confusion their assurances that no such activity was scheduled or known adding layers to the mystery. Driven by a mixture of fear and fascination, I embarked on a quest for answers, delving into the history of the inn and the land upon which it stood. The library in the nearby town, with its archives of local history and folklore, became my sanctuary, a place where I pieced together the puzzle of the nightly procession. The breakthrough came with the discovery of an ancient manuscript a text that spoke of a time long before the hotel's construction, when the land was believed to be sacred. The manuscript detailed a ritualistic path, an ancient route used for solemn processions and rituals, a path of spiritual significance that had been walked upon for centuries by those who believed in its power to bridge the worlds of the living and the dead. The realization that the Inn of the Whispering Pines was built along this ancient route was a revelation that cast the nightly procession in a new light. The figures that passed by my door were not mere phantoms of the imagination but echoes of the past, spirits that continued their timeless march along the sacred path, oblivious to the changes that had transformed their once sacred ground into a modern haven for weary travelers. Armed with this knowledge, I approached the nightly spectacle not with fear but with reverence, a witness to a ritual that transcended time. Each evening, as the shadows lengthened and the world outside my door grew silent, I watched in silent homage as the procession made its way through the hotel, a living tapestry of history that whispered tales of lives once lived and the enduring power of tradition. The days turned into weeks, and with each night spent at the inn, my connection to the procession deepened. I began to recognize the figures, their individual stories unfolding within the pages of the ancient manuscript and the historical records I unearthed. There was the lady in Victorian attire a local aristocrat who had championed the rights of the land and its people, the soldier from the Great War, returning home to find peace the young girl in her Sunday best, clutching a doll, a symbol of the innocence lost to the passage of time. As my departure day approached, I found myself reluctant to leave, the inn and its nightly visitors having woven themselves into the fabric of my being. On my final night, I stepped out into the hallway, a silent observer no longer content to watch from behind the safety of my door. The procession, so familiar by now, paused as I joined their ranks, a living participant in their ancient ritual. We moved together, a silent covenant between the past and the present, until the first light of dawn began to dispel the shadows of the hallway. With the coming of the morning, the figures faded, their forms dissolving into the light, leaving me alone in the empty corridor. Yet the sense of peace that enveloped me was profound, 
a testament to the understanding that had blossomed within me, a recognition of the timeless nature of the human spirit and the connections that bind us across the ages. My time at the Inn of the Whispering Pines came to an end, but the experiences I had there remained, a cherished memory of the nights I spent in communion with the past. The hotel, with its serene beauty and its guardians of history, stood as a beacon to those who sought to understand the depth of our connection to the land and to each other. As I drove away, the hotel receding in my rearview mirror, I carried with me a sense of purpose, a determination to share the story of the nightly procession and the sacred path that lay beneath the inn. The manuscript and historical records, once hidden in the dusty corners of the local library, would now serve as the foundation for a book, a narrative that would weave together the tales of the past with the experience of the present, a bridge between worlds. The Inn of the Whispering Pines, with its nightly visitors and its ancient history, had awakened in me a passion for storytelling, a desire to explore the mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of the scene. And as I embarked on this new journey, the silent procession continued its eternal march, a reminder of the enduring spirit that connects us all. Story 36 Upon my arrival at the Seabrook Hotel, nestled on the cliffs overlooking the tumultuous ocean below, the vibrant atmosphere was palpable. Guests mingled in the grand lobby, their laughter and conversations weaving a tapestry of liveliness and warmth. The hotel, renowned for its breathtaking views and impeccable service, promised a retreat from the mundanity of daily life. Little did I know, my stay would unravel into an experience far removed from the ordinary, challenging the very fabric of reality as I understood it. The initial days were marked by exploration and relaxation, the hotel offering endless comforts and activities. However, a subtle shift began to manifest, so gradual at first that I questioned whether it was merely my imagination. The other guests, once vivid in their presence and demeanor, started to fade from my perception, their forms blurring at the edges, becoming translucent shadows of their former selves. Their attempts to engage in conversation became increasingly strained. Their voices, once clear and distinct, now echoed as if from a great distance, their words slipping through my grasp like smoke. The vibrant atmosphere of the hotel dimmed, replaced by an inexplicable sense of isolation and detachment. With each passing day, the phenomenon intensified. The guests that had roamed the halls, basked in the sun, and filled the dining room with the clamor of cutlery and conversation, now moved like phantoms, their laughter a distant memory. The staff, too, seemed oblivious to the change, going about their duties with an air of normalcy that stood in stark contrast to the surreal emptiness that enveloped me. Driven by a need to understand the unnerving transformation of the Seabrook Hotel, I delved into its history, hoping to find answers hidden within its storied past. The local library became a haven of research, its archives offering a glimpse into the hotel's origins and the land upon which it stood. What I uncovered was a history steeped in mystery and tragedy. The Seabrook Hotel had been built on a site long believed to be cursed by the local populace, a place where the veil between worlds was thin and spirits wandered lost. A series of unexplained disappearances throughout the hotel's history added layers to the lore, each account a piece of the puzzle that had become my reality. As my stay progressed, the world around me seemed to fade further into obscurity, the hotel and its inhabitants more like echoes of a bygone era than participants in the present. On the eve of my departure, the Seabrook Hotel stood entirely empty, a grand but silent monument to the unseen forces that shaped its existence. The morning of my departure dawned, the hotel cloaked in an impenetrable fog that mirrored the confusion and fear that had taken root in my heart. The lobby, once bustling with activity, was desolate, the echo of my footsteps a solitary sound in the vast emptiness. It was then that the hotel's oldest caretaker appeared, a figure that seemed untouched by the fading that had claimed the others. In his eyes I saw a depth of knowledge and sorrow an understanding of the hotel's true nature that transcended the physical world. He spoke of the Seabrook's curse, a pact made long ago with forces beyond comprehension, in exchange for prosperity and renown. The hotel, he explained, was a liminal space, a threshold between the tangible and the ethereal, where the souls of the past lingered, bound to the site of their unrest. 
The fading of the guests, he revealed, was a cycle, a manifestation of the hotel's need to reconcile its existence between two worlds. My perception of the transformation was not a descent into madness, but a glimpse into the reality that underpinned the Seabrook Hotel, a reality that few were privy to. Armed with this knowledge, I faced the choice of leaving, of stepping back into the world I knew, or staying, to delve deeper into the mysteries that the Seabrook held. The decision was not easy, the allure of the unknown a powerful force that tugged at the very core of my being. In the end, I chose to leave, to carry the story of the Seabrook Hotel and its fading guests back into the world. The hotel, with its spectral inhabitants and cursed foundations, remained a beacon of mystery, a reminder of the thin veil that separates our reality from the realms beyond. As I drove away from the Seabrook, the fog lifted, revealing the path ahead with startling clarity. The experience had changed me, opened my eyes to the possibilities that lay just beyond the edge of perception. The hotel and its inhabitants, though faded from view, remained etched in my memory, a haunting testament to the mysteries that lie in wait for those brave enough to seek them out. In the years that followed, I documented my experience at the Seabrook Hotel, the tale of the fading guests becoming a narrative that captivated those with a penchant for the supernatural and the unexplained. The book, a detailed account of my stay in the history of the hotel, offered a window into a world where the past and present coalesced, where spirits walked the halls of the living, and the fabric of reality was ever in flux. The Seabrook Hotel continued to welcome guests, its reputation for otherworldly encounters a draw for those in search of the paranormal. And while some experienced the fading, others found only the tranquility and beauty that the hotel had long been known for. For me, the Seabrook Hotel remained a milestone in my journey a place where the boundaries of my understanding were challenged and expanded. It stood as a testament to the mysteries that surround us, hidden in plain sight, waiting for the moment when our perception shifts and we see the world anew. Story 37 The allure of the Alderbrook Inn had always been rooted in its promise of peace and isolation, perched as it was on the edge of a dense forest that stretched endlessly into the horizon. Its remote location and storied past drew me in, a writer in search of silence to drown out the noise of the world and delve deep into my next project. Yet what I discovered within its walls was far from the sanctuary I had envisioned. From the outset, my stay was underscored by an inexplicable unease, a sensation of being watched that I attributed to the adjustment of settling into a new place. However, as nights fell and the inn's true nature began to unveil itself, my unease turned to alarm. Whispers echoed in my room under the cloak of darkness, conversations I had during the day replayed with sinister twists, infusing my fears and anxieties into dialogues I had never uttered. Initially, I rationalized the whispers as the byproduct of stress, a mind overwrought with work and expectation, conjuring illusions from the silence. But as the phenomenon persisted, growing in intensity with each passing night, denial became impossible. The walls themselves seemed to come alive, absorbing the essence of my day only to regurgitate it in twisted echoes that filled the darkness. Compelled by a mix of fear and curiosity, I set out to unravel the mystery of the Alderbrook Inn, to understand the source of the whispers that breached the sanctity of my thoughts. My investigations led me to the inn's forgotten spaces, hidden corridors and sealed rooms that whispered tales of its past. It was in one such hidden compartment, cleverly disguised within the room's ornate paneling, that I discovered the remnants of an old surveillance project. Dust covered and long abandoned, the recording devices bore witness to a time when the inn had served a far more sinister purpose. Reels of tape and journals, meticulously detailed, hinted at an experiment that sought to delve into the psyche of its subjects, to manipulate and control through the power of suggestion and fear. The realization that I was not the first to fall prey to the inn's machinations, that the whispers were not mere figments of my imagination but echoes of a long abandoned project that perhaps wasn't so abandoned after all, sent a chill down my spine. The inn with its mimicking walls had become a prison, a place where fears were not just acknowledged but amplified turned against those who sought refuge within its embrace. Driven by a desperate need to escape the clutches of the inn and its sinister legacy, I confronted the current caretaker a reclusive figure who had always seemed part of the very fabric of the building. 
My accusations were met with silence, a gaze that bore the weight of secrets and guilt. It was then that the truth spilled forth, a confession that the project had never truly been abandoned, merely evolved. The inn's guests, unwitting participants in an ongoing experiment that sought to understand the depths of human fear and resilience, were monitored, their every word and reaction recorded within the walls that had become both sentinel and confessor. The caretaker, a remnant of the original project, had continued the work, driven by a twisted fascination with the power of fear to unravel the human psyche. Faced with the magnitude of the betrayal, my resolve hardened. The Alderbrook Inn, with its twisted legacy, could not continue to prey upon those who crossed its threshold in search of solace. The evidence I had gathered, the recordings and journals hidden within the walls, became the catalyst for exposing the dark heart of the inn. The days that followed were marked by a flurry of activity, as authorities descended upon the Alderbrook Inn, unraveling the threads of its dark history. The media swarmed, drawn by the tale of a writer who uncovered a legacy of surveillance and psychological manipulation hidden within the walls of a seemingly innocuous inn. As the inn was shuttered, its future uncertain amidst the scandal and investigations, I took solace in the knowledge that the whispers would haunt no more. The legacy of the Alderbrook Inn, with its mimicking walls and twisted experiments, would serve as a cautionary tale, a reminder of the darkness that can dwell in the heart of man. In the aftermath, my experience at the Alderbrook Inn became the foundation of my next project, a narrative that delved into the human psyche's vulnerability and resilience. The book, a fusion of personal ordeal and fictional exploration, resonated with readers, a testament to the enduring fascination with the unseen forces that shape our fears and desires. The Alderbrook Inn, now abandoned, stands as a monument to the past, its walls silenced, the whispers that once echoed through its corridor stilled. And as I move forward, the experience remains a part of me, a reminder of the thin line that separates reality from the darkness that lurks in the shadows of the mind. Story 38 Upon my arrival at the Labyrinthine Retreat, an elegant and sprawling hotel nestled in the heart of a dense, whispering forest, the air was tinged with the scent of mystery and the unknown. Renowned for its extensive gardens and intricate architecture, the hotel was a marvel, a place where reality seemed to bend in the most enchanting ways. Little did I realize the enchantment harbored a bewildering secret that would challenge the very essence of my perception. The first few days were filled with awe and exploration, each turn revealing hidden courtyards and secluded nooks, the hotel an endless source of fascination. However, as the days passed, a subtle unease began to settle in, a feeling that the walls themselves were shifting, altering the very fabric of the hotel's layout. One evening, after dining in the hotel's grand hall, I decided to return to my room for a night of rest and reflection. The path, once familiar and welcoming, transformed before my eyes. Always twisted and turned in impossible ways, the familiar landmarks that had guided my steps now leading me further into confusion. The more I walked, the more disoriented I became. Corridors that should have led me back to the comfort of my room instead spiraled into a labyrinthine maze, each turn compounding my frustration and fear. Doors that once opened to recognizable rooms now revealed spaces alien and uninviting, as if the hotel itself had become a living entity, reshaping its interior to confound and disorient. I'm lost all meaning as I wandered the endless maze, minutes stretching into hours with no sign of escape. The once enchanting whispers of the hotel now seemed to mock my plight, the laughter and conversations of unseen guests echoing down the shifting hallways. In my desperation, I reached out to the staff, their faces blurring into the shifting landscape of the hotel. Their responses when they could be found were cryptic, suggesting that the path to my room lay not in the physical space, but in understanding the hotel's true nature. Driven by a need to escape the maze, I delved into the history of the labyrinthine retreat, seeking answers in the dusty tomes and faded maps that filled the hotel's library. What I discovered was a tale of ambition and hubris, a narrative that spoke of the hotel's creator, a visionary architect whose obsession with the concept of a living, breathing building had led to the creation of the labyrinthine retreat. The architect, it seemed, had designed the hotel to be an ever-evolving entity, a structure that responded to the emotions and desires of its guests, 
reshaping itself in an endless dance of creation and recreation. This revelation, while fascinating, offered little in the way of solace. The knowledge that the hotel was alive, its walls and corridors an extension of a long dead visionary's will, only served to heighten my sense of entrapment. As the night wore on, my resolve hardened. If the hotel was indeed a reflection of its guests' innermost thoughts and desires, then perhaps the key to escaping the maze lay within myself. Focusing on my memories of the hotel as it was when I first arrived, I began to navigate the shifting corridors with a renewed sense of purpose, each step guided by the desire to return to a state of familiarity and safety. Miraculously, the hotel responded. The endless corridors began to straighten, the alien doors returning to their rightful places. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the maze dissolved, the familiar path to my room emerging from the chaos. The door to my room swung open with an ease that belied the ordeal I had endured. Inside, everything was as I had left it, the familiar comforts a stark contrast to the disorienting nightmare of the maze. The relief was overwhelming, a rush of emotion that brought me to my knees. In the days that followed, my experience in the maze became a catalyst for change. The labyrinthine retreat, with its living walls and shifting corridors, had challenged me to confront my fears, to navigate the labyrinth of my own doubts and insecurities. The hotel, for all its mystery and bewilderment, was more than just a place of accommodation. It was a journey, a rite of passage that each guest experienced in their own unique way. And while some might find themselves lost in its corridors, others would emerge transformed, their path through the maze a metaphor for the journey we all undertake in search of our true selves. As I checked out of the labyrinthine retreat, the hotel standing serene and imposing against the backdrop of the forest, I knew that my experience would stay with me, a reminder of the power of perception and the endless paths that life offers. The hotel, with its living architecture and enigmatic creator, had become a part of my story, a chapter that I would revisit in times of reflection, marveling at the mystery of the disorienting maze and the lessons it had imparted. Story 39 My visit to the historic Edgewater Inn, perched precariously on the cliff's edge overlooking the stormy sea below, was intended as a retreat a chance to escape the monotony and pressures of daily life. The hotel, renowned for its breathtaking views and storied past, promised a mix of luxury and solitude. However, what I discovered within its venerable walls was a mystery that transcended the bounds of the ordinary, drawing me into a tale of ambition packed and eternal vigilance. Upon my arrival, I was immediately struck by the grandeur of the lobby, its vaulted ceilings and ornate furnishings speaking to a bygone era of elegance and opulence. It was the portraits, however, that commanded my attention large imposing paintings of the hotel's founders that lined the walls, their gazes piercing, almost lifelike, as if they were silently appraising each new guest that crossed the threshold. As the days passed, an unsettling realization began to dawn on me. The portraits, or more specifically the eyes within them, seemed to follow my movements, a trick of the light and shadow I initially reasoned. Yet, as night fell, and the hotel's corridors were bathed in the soft glow of moonlight, the portraits appeared to change, their expressions darkening, aging before my eyes to reveal sinister countenances that bore little resemblance to their daytime visages. Driven by a mix of curiosity and unease, I began to investigate, my inquiries leading me to a locked cabinet in the hotel's library, a cabinet that, as fate would have it, I found surprisingly ajar one evening. Within I discovered the personal journals of the hotel's primary founder, Jonathan Edgewater, a man whose vision and determination had been instrumental in the establishment of the Edgewater Inn. The journals spoke of ambition and dreams, of a desire to create a hotel that would stand as a beacon of luxury and refinement. But woven through the pages of aspirations were darker admissions, hints of a pact made in the pursuit of that dream, a pact that promised prosperity and renown in exchange for a price far more sinister than mere financial obligation. Jonathan Edgewater had sought immortality, not for himself, but for his legacy. The pact made with entities whose nature he scarcely understood, bound the spirits of the founders to the hotel, tasking them with its oversight for eternity. The portraits, 
Far from mere decorative tributes were conduits for their vigilance, windows through which they could watch over the Edgewater Inn and its guests. Armed with this knowledge, the nightly transformations of the portraits took on a new, more malevolent aspect. The changing expressions, the aging of the faces, these were manifestations of the Founders' spirits, their eternal vigil twisted by time and the nature of the pact into something unrecognizable, a surveillance born of an obligation that had long since curdled into resentment and envy. The realization that I was being watched, not by the benign interest of a hotel's caretakers, but by the watchful eyes of those bound to its walls by a dark bargain, was chilling. The hotel, with its stunning views and architectural beauty, was a prison for its founders, their spirits tethered to its fate, forever observing the passage of time and the lives of those who came and went. As my stay drew to a close, the ambience of the Edgewater Inn shifted. Whispers echoed in the corridors at night, the portraits' gazes growing increasingly malevolent, as if angered by my knowledge of their secret. The line between observer and observed blurred, the watchful portraits a constant reminder of the pact that held sway over the hotel. On the night before my departure, a storm raged outside, the howling wind and crashing waves a fitting backdrop to the tumultuous thoughts that raced through my mind. The portraits, more animated than ever, seemed to anticipate my leaving, their expressions twisted in a macabre semblance of farewell. Leaving the Edgewater Inn, I could not shake the feeling of being watched, the gazes of the founders etched into my memory. The hotel, for all its beauty and allure, was a place of secrets and shadows, its legacy overshadowed by the pact that had ensured its prosperity at a cost too great to fathom. The story of the Edgewater Inn and its watchful portraits became a chapter in my travels, a tale of ambition that bordered on hubris and of a vigilance that transcended the grave. The hotel, a landmark to some, stood as a cautionary reminder to me a reminder that some legacies carry a burden far heavier than the stone and mortar from which they are built. As I shared the tale of the Edgewater Inn and its eternal overseers, the story took on a life of its own, a narrative that spoke to the timeless human themes of desire, sacrifice, and the unending quest for legacy. The hotel, with its watchful portraits and whispered secrets, remained a beacon, not of luxury, but of the profound and sometimes perilous depths of human ambition. Story 40 The day I checked into the Grand Celestial Hotel, a towering edifice of glass and steel that pierced the skyline with its architectural grandeur, was filled with a sense of anticipation. Renowned for its luxurious accommodations and impeccable service, the hotel was a haven for travelers seeking the pinnacle of comfort and elegance. My room on the 12th floor boasted breathtaking views of the city, a sprawling panorama that stretched to the horizon, the city lights a glittering tapestry beneath the starlit sky. The evening passed in a blur of relaxation and indulgence, the stresses of travel melting away in the opulence of my surroundings. Yet, as I settled into the plush comfort of the bed, a sense of unease prickled at the edge of my consciousness, an inexplicable feeling that something was amiss. Dismissing it as the product of an overactive imagination, I drifted into a fitful sleep, the city's nocturnal symphony a distant lullaby. The next morning I awoke to a reality that defied comprehension. The Grand Celestial Hotel, with its twelve floors of luxury, had inexplicably changed overnight. The twelfth floor, my floor, had vanished without a trace, the elevator now bypassing it entirely its digital display transitioning from the 11th to the 14th floor with an unsettling finality. Confusion turned to disbelief as my inquiries were met with blank stares and polite denials from the hotel staff. According to them, the Grand Celestial had always been an 11th floor hotel, there was no 12th floor, and there never had been. My insistence only served to deepen their concern for my well-being, their sympathetic smiles masking a growing suspicion of my mental state. The key card in my pocket, once the key to my room on the non-existent 12th floor, now opened a door on the 11th, a room identical to my own in every detail except for its location. My belongings, previously secured in my room, were found scattered across various rooms on the 11th floor, as if dispersed by an unseen hand. Determined to uncover the truth, I embarked on a quest for answers, delving into the history of the Grand Celestial Hotel. 
The deeper I dug, the more the lines between reality and impossibility blurred. The hotel's archives, a collection of blueprints, photographs, and documents, hinted at a past shrouded in mystery and speculation. There were mentions of architectural anomalies, of floors that appeared and disappeared in the hotel's early years, a phenomenon attributed to the eccentricities of its visionary creator. As the days passed, the hotel seemed to warp around me, its corridors and rooms shifting in subtle, disconcerting ways. The other guests and staff remained oblivious to these changes, their reality anchored in a version of the hotel that had no place for anomalies or vanishing floors. My investigation led me to an elderly employee, a custodian who had been with the hotel since its opening. In hushed tones, he spoke of the founder's obsession with creating a hotel that transcended the ordinary, a building that was not only a marvel of architecture but a living entity capable of change and adaptation. The twelfth floor, he revealed, was the heart of this vision, a floor that existed between the realms of tangible and ethereal, a space that could be reshaped by the will of the hotel itself. The key card I possessed was not merely a means of access but a link to the twelfth floor, a floor that now existed only for those who could perceive its presence. Armed with this knowledge, I sought to confront the reality of the Grand Celestial Hotel, to reconcile the existence of the twelfth floor with the denial of its presence. Yet, as I stood before the elevator, the key card in hand, I realized that the hotel was not a mere structure of glass and steel but a labyrinth of perception and belief, its architecture a reflection of the minds that inhabited its spaces. The decision to leave, to step away from the enigma of the Grand Celestial Hotel, was made with a heavy heart. The mystery of the vanishing floor remained unsolved, a narrative thread woven into the fabric of the hotel's history, a story that would continue to unfold in the shadows of perception and reality. As I departed, the Grand Celestial Hotel stood as a monument to the unknown, its secrets guarded by the passage of time and the veil of disbelief. The experience had changed me, opening my eyes to the possibilities that lay just beyond the edge of understanding, a reminder that reality is often stranger and more malleable than we dare to imagine. The tale of the vanishing floor and my journey through the shifting reality of the Grand Celestial Hotel became a chapter in my life, a story shared in whispers and wonder. The hotel, with its ever-changing corridors and elusive mysteries, remained a beacon for those who seek to explore the boundaries of the known, a reminder that the world is filled with wonders and enigmas waiting to be discovered.